you're live whenever you're ready to go. Yes, good evening. Uh, I'd like to call to order the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee, June 14, 2021. Uh, and I'll start off uh, by reading the land acknowledgement. Today we acknowledge that Collingwood is located on the traditional territory of the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, including the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee and Ojibwe peoples, and on lands connected with the Lake Simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of 1818. This is the home of a diverse range of Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. Uh, first item up is adopting the agenda. Uh, and the motion is that the content of the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee agenda for June 14, 2021 be adopted as presented. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder, please? And uh, that would be Deputy Mayor Hall and Councillor Doherty, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Item three on the agenda, declaration of pecuniary interest. If anyone has a declaration, that would be Vice Chair Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. With respect to 7.4 uh, in terms of the temporary traffic calming, um, an immediate family member owns property directly across from Cameron Street School and abutting the street. So I will be uh, declaring a conflict with respect to that and asking if you could sever it out so that I could work uh, vote on the balance of the report. Thank you. Okay, I will do. Any other conflicts? Uh, if you do find yourself in one, please declare it at that time. Uh, our, and the next item would be business arising from previous meeting. Uh, would there be any? Okay, great. So we're moving right along to deputations. 5.1, status of community developments. Uh, would Shelley Wells be here this evening? She is, she's just being promoted to a panel, so she should be with us very shortly. And Pete Graham is here as well. Fantastic, thank you. Good evening. Just checking to make sure that you can hear me. Yes, you're great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Counselors, staff, fellow residents out there in Zoom land. My name is Shelley Wells from Plan Wells Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of Mayor Mills and Granite Homes, owners of the Panorama subdivision. With me is Pete Graham. Ever the gentleman, Pete had asked me to speak first, but I think he'd like to uh, have speak a few words at the end of my presentation. It's been some time since we were here before council to talk about Panorama subdivision. On tonight's agenda is the uh, staff report uh, recommending extension of draft plan approval for Panorama. And Pete and I thought it would be a good time to update you on work underway to advance to phase one of registration. And um, also we had some comments on a few of the proposed new draft conditions and a couple of challenges that we'd like to talk about. I did have a presentation um, that, uh, yes, there it is, thank you. Uh, could you give me the next slide, please? So this aerial has a lot of information on it, but I wanted to put Panorama in context of the rest of the development that's uh, occurring around it or has already occurred. So you can see the Panorama subdivision, which is located on the southwest corner of Mountain Road and 10th Line. Immediately west of it is the existing Mayor Mills subdivision. South of that is the Blue Mountain Golf and Country Club. And then south of that again is the Lynx View subdivision. And then below that is the Fletcher's Field. On the other side of 10th Line, is the side launch brewery and there are a number of uh, tenants in that building. I think it was originally the Goodyear plant. Just south of that is the Red Maple subdivision. And then of course the existing Georgian Meadows subdivision at 6th Street and 10th line. Taylor Creek, uh, which is the stormwater outlet for Panorama is located between the side launch brewery and the Red Maple subdivision. 
And then one other necessary offsite improvement to bring a panorama to registration is the, along with, I guess, Lynxview and Red Maple, is upgrades to the Stewart Road water booster station and the trunk water main. And you can see where the Stewart Road uh, booster station is located with the yellow star in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. And then the trunk water main in light blue runs along 6th Street and up 10th line to the Panorama subdivision. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk just briefly about uh, Panorama. Uh, the site-specific zoning is in place. It's already been approved for some time. There is a local commercial, convenience commercial block located uh, at the corner of Mountain Road and 10th Line. And that convenience commercial block will service the existing subdivisions in the area, Mayor Mills and um, Georgian Meadows, and then also future uh, greenfield development that is planned for the area, Linksview, Red Maple, and probably some subdivisions west of there as well. Uh, there will be in total 319 dwellings approximately, uh, including freehold street towns on the blocks and also stacked townhouses. And there's a combined park and stormwater block that fronts onto uh, the uh, tenth line. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned to you, Earlier, two of the necessary off-site infrastructure improvements to register phase one of Panorama include the Taylor Creek rechannelization and extension of the Trunk Water Main and Stewart Road uh, Booster Station. So the Taylor Creek rechannelization has now been completed. And participating in the funding for this work were the owners of Panorama, Red Maple, and Georgian Bay Biomed. However, the work to construct the Trunk, trunk Water Main and booster station is not complete. In fact, it's not even started. There was an agreement in place a couple of years ago to fund this work. And at the time, at that time, the owners of Panorama posted $2.9 million in securities to ensure that that work would get done. But the owners of Red Maple were unable to post their securities um, and they built out a model suite and they commenced some home, some home sales. But since that time, the Red Maple subdivision has been sold. So has the Lynxview subdivision. So a new agreement among the parties is now necessary before this critical work can get started. So next slide, please. So with the change in ownership, the new agreement, which is now being called the Advanced Timing of Infrastructure Agreement, uh, needs to be executed. Craig Robson. Panorama's lawyer has been working with the adjacent new owners and the toned lawyers to draft this cost-sharing agreement. But as uh, we know, the interim control bylaw was recently passed and Mr. Robson received notice that the town um, has been advised to hold off on this agreement until the, the, the town's review has been completed. So the agreement's on hold. And this is of great concern to us the engineers have told us that from the time uh, construction commences, it'll take over two years to complete these offsite infrastructure improvements. And that's probably seasonal work. Um, so it is of concern that uh, aspect of the work that's necessary to register phase one of, of this subdivision. Next slide, please. I want to tell you a little bit about Granite Homes. They're building in Guelph. Cambridge, Kitchener, and their latest subdivision is in Alora. They've won a number of awards and I haven't posted them all here, but um, let you know that uh, they, they have won some awards for their product and uh, they are uh, actively building in other communities. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to give you a feel for some of their current product. And this product is being developed for the Alora subdivision which will be built out shortly. These are bungalows, bungalows, very popular configuration. Next slide, please. These are two-story homes, traditional two stories with a double garage. Next slide, please. Town homes, the three town homes. These are two different architectural treatments. Next slide, please. 
And these are stacked townhomes. The panorama zoning bylaw does uh, permit four stacked townhomes. They're a very popular uh, configuration because they're, they're more attainable than say a single family home. And uh, so these will be condominium tender, tenure. Most uh, stacked homes are condominium tenure. Uh, next slide, please. So the staff report before you tonight recommends the uh, uh, draft plan extension for Panorama. We support uh, staff's recommendation that the Panorama subdivision be extended. And we concur that Panorama uh, meet, has merit and it complies with the town's uh, official plan policies and the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. In the staff report, the proposed lapse date for the extension is June 2024. So that's three years out. Our request is to extend the Panorama draft plan approval until June 25th, 2025 for the necessary external water infrastructure work to be completed. And I noted earlier that it's two years from start of construction to complete the trunk water main and booster station. Today, there's no agreement in place. In fact, there's no work happening on the agreement. Also, the three-year lap state as proposed in the staff report is not aligned with the timing for the completion of the water treatment plant expansion, which is 2025. And therefore it's not aligned with projected water availability. So if all that work, including the availability of water can't be completed before the extension lapses, the Granite Homes will in, have invested in external infrastructure, reconstruction of Taylor Creek, which is already done. And then the expense for the Stewart Road booster station, all of that without a firm identifiable path to convey lots or commence construction. Next slide, please. So let's look at some of the costs between now and phase one registration. And there are a lot of expenditures, as you probably know, both offsite and onsite to get to phase one registration. So consultant fees for clearances, 350,000 to 500,000 is estimate. But the big expense, 10 million to $12 million for internal servicing plus securities, and then plus all of the costs for Taylor Creek work that's already been done, and then the booster station and the trunk water main to bring water to the site. So we're of the opinion that external and infrastructure investment by required of the proponent should be matched with development approvals and water allocation timelines. And we think 2024 falls short, three years falls short. So we're asking for a lapse date to June 2025 so that it aligns with the water treatment plant expansion. Next slide, please. Another new condition that's being proposed by staff uh, relates um, to the trunk water main and booster station, and that's condition 22. And our request is not that this new condition be altered but that the work to get the agreement executed be jump-started again and the construction get going. Two years goes by so quickly to actually do that work. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done before you even get to commence construction. The agreement has to be put into place. We need uh, approval from the province. I think the design is mostly complete, but perhaps a bit of work left to do there. It needs to be tendered. Some of it's seasonal work. So um, that goes by pretty quickly. So we're asking that the town work with us and start again to um, get this agreement in place and get this construction underway. Uh, next um, slide, please. Now I wanted to speak for a while. I have a few things to say about new conditions 46.1 and 46.2. I wanted to first say that we support mechanisms to, to uh, promote good service. Miles, um, your 10 minutes is up, so perhaps you could uh, bring this to conclusion, please. Yes, okay. Um, we're asking that, uh, maybe move me to the next slide, please. So we're in the next slide. Okay, so next slide. We're saying the proposal to post securities to enforce design is unusual and unnecessary. 
The requirement to apply architectural control to blocks is also unusual and unnecessary. And we don't think these conditions reflect best practice. Next slide, please. So in summary, we're suggesting a different condition, which I've laid out here. It's uh, short, but I think it gets the job done and it covers best practice. Next slide, please. We think the construction and communication management plan is something that maybe should be done by staff in conjunction with council, and then uh, it can be amended for each project uh, so that it's not a grab bag of techniques. Next slide, please. And proposed condition 46.5, we think the level of detail proposed in this condition is normally required at site plan approval not prior to registration. So we're requesting that this condition be reworded to reflect best practice industry standards or eliminated entirely. Next slide. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to make this. I can answer any questions and I believe uh, Pete uh, had a few words to say as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So, uh, thanks, Shelly. Uh, my name is Pete Graham, and I'm, I'm acting on behalf of Granite Homes and Mary Mills Village, Inc. Uh, I wanted just to focus on two uh, points that Shelly had brought up in her presentation. Uh, the first is the advanced timing of infrastructure agreement or the external water agreement. And that's, as Shelly mentioned, is it, it allows the Stewart Road booster station and reservoir and the water main to be constructed. So at this time, this draft agreement has the town of Collingwood and participating 10th line landowners financing the municipal water infrastructure. So contributing landowners uh, would be paid back by either future development charge credits and, and or annual payments uh, made over time. So one thing that Shelley mentioned, and I just, if, if I could get it clarified tonight, uh, the required, I, I know there, there were changes required for the design and, I, and I'd like to know if the design is now 100% complete. And then if so, uh, does the town have the ECA, the uh, environmental compliance approval? Uh, do, do they have that in place as well? Now there has been a delay uh, in, in advancing this agreement. And I know the town continues to collect development charges. So my question is, would the town be in a position to increase their share of the municipal water infrastructure costs. So we'd, we'd welcome a discussion on that at the appropriate time. The second item is about timing and Shelly talked about this. Um, and and I, I wanna be clear, so maybe if, if someone could help me with this tonight, mm -hmm. is from what I understand that the planning policy study could take up to a year to complete. So if, if that's, and, and we are being asked to wait to do this, to, to, to complete our external water servicing agreement until this planning policy study is done. So if that's the case, we're in May, June of 2022, the, the, the planning policy study is done. The say fall of 2022, winter of 2023, we're, we're working on and hopefully finalizing our water servicing agreement. Then as Shelley said, we have to tender the job or, the, or in this case, the town would, and then any, any other permits that are required so my estimate, we're not starting, or at least the town's not starting until maybe the spring of 2023, and the construction would be finished at the end, I hope, by the end of 2024. So according, and then according to the staff report, uh, our draft plan expires June of 2024. So you're asking us to finance this municipal infrastructure, and our draft plan would, would lapse before the work's completed, and more importantly, there's still, we, we still don't have water allocated to our, our project. So our ask to the committee and council are, finish the advanced timing of infrastructure agreement now. Our latest comments were, were provided to town staff in early March of 2021. So staff have our comments. We would like feedback and it does not make sense to put this agreement on hold. And secondly, and more importantly, align our draft plan extension so when the water will be available. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your presentations. Um, 
I will uh, deal with these uh, perhaps when we deal with the item uh, later in the agenda. But thank you, thank you for that. Well, um, unless unless council has any uh, or committee members have any questions of our deputants at this point. Nope, seeing none. Okay, thank you. The next deputation uh, on the agenda is uh, relating to 11403, 11453, and 11461 Highway 26 West. And there's two people presenting on behalf of Sky Defco. Deputy Clerk, would they be uh, in the waiting room? I, I see Carrie in there, so we're just putting her in, and there's Bert. Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, you are. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Um, I was just saying, I'm certainly glad that you needed to say the address and uh, I didn't need to spit out the, uh, the three addresses. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And thank you to this uh, committee for, for hearing our presentation tonight. Um, we wanted to get the word out about our rental housing development uh, that we're proposing within the town of Collingwood, uh, such that we can proceed to approvals at the earliest possible opportunity. This site's located right on Highway 26, and it includes both rental apartments and townhouses. Um, next slide, please, in the presentation. Um, so th we thought we'd just cover a bit about, you know, who is Skyline and, and what are we all about, uh, but really focus our presentation uh, to provide you with greater in-depth details about the development uh, that would be coming forward for site plan approval, and then finish with the key benefits of our development um, that would be outlined within our request for an exemption. Next slide, please. And so the Skyline Group of Companies is a, a Guelph-based real estate company that has grown over the past 20 years to be a national provider of rental housing, retail shopping, industrial real estate, as well as having a clean energy fund. SkyDev is the development arm of Skyline, supporting projects across each of these business areas as well as new ventures. Our long-term view of property ownership means that it makes sense for us to invest in initiatives for the people who live in our developments. In our designs, we really try to start with the end in mind. What suite features are needed? What amenities do the tenants in this market desire? And we create places that people want to live. Next slide, please. We really believe that doing good is good for business. And we take every opportunity to invest in sustainability initiatives that enhance our community well-being, as well as, of course, saving money and saving the planet. These features include low-flow low water fixtures, high-efficiency heating and cooling systems, and enhanced insulation. We also include EV charging stations or honeybees on our rooftops on some of our projects. Skyline is really committed to giving back to the communities that we're a part of. We have paid volunteers for each of the staff in our communities across Canada to give back to the communities that they live in. At SkyDev, we're also donating our time and land to help create a sustainable housing project in Guelph. Sustainability and powered by people really are something that uh, we live every day and, and in particular try to embed within our development projects. Next slide, please. In Ontario, we're facing a housing crisis. Home prices and rents have risen far faster than the income levels of most, Canadian, of most Ontarians. There are issues on both the demand and supply side that are causing these rapid increases. For rental apartments, the cost associated with time, whether it be public resistance to density or approval timelines, as well as the soaring costs of materials and labor have been huge factors and in fact, many developers choose to build condos instead of rental housing. In fact, less than 7% of the housing built has been intended as, re as rental. Specifically in Collingwood, there's increased pressures with extremely low vacancy rates, coupled with the additional demands of affluent retirees, short-term rentals, as well as a flood of buyers from outside of Collingwood seeking more space. 
There's more pressure than ever, and this is leading to increased costs in housing. Our proposed project would provide 187 rental apartments and 60 townhouses to the community to start to turn this tide. And with that, I'll focus now maybe a bit more on our development uh, with the next slide. And so we've been working with town staff as well as the NVCA on our project details over the past two years. And we're here today to review these with you such that our site plan approval can be recommended to council at the earliest possible time. Recognizing the pressures uh, on the town with limited water supply, we have scoped our exemption request to the rental housing component only. While we would love to build this all together, we recognize that the greater benefit to the community is for the rental housing component. July approval of these two items would allow us to offer occupancy in 2023 following construction. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Lorraine who will walk through some of our development details. Thank you, Carrie. Next slide, please. As you can see on the plan attached, Skydive's property is highlighted in red and located on Highway 26 West. Next slide, please. This is our current site plan. The site is comprised of 187 rental apartment units and 60 townhouse units. The proposed site plan is fully zoning compliant. We propose to, con to do construction that will include intersection and signal upgrades, as you can see identified in red on the plan, at the northern entrance of our site, which forms the common roadway to, divide, to provide access to the rental apartments on the left and the condominium townhouses on the right. We are proposing to provide parking at a rate of two per unit on the townhouses, and rental apartments will have 247 total parking spaces between underground and surface parking facilities. We're proposing to construct continuation of the Cranberry Trail along the frontage of our property on Highway 26 as shown in pink on the attached plan, as well as in yellow, which cuts through the site. Our severance and common elements roadway is being created by way of a vacant land condo to ensure ongoing maintenance requirements are clearly set out for both the rental apartment property and the townhouses. The vacant land condo will create the shared common roadway and create a separate parcel of land for the rental apartment development. We're seeking exemption to the condo process under which is being reviewed by staff. In our second submission of our site plan, we made a number of changes to address comments that we received from staff. And the top three that we'll highlight are that we pulled the apartments away from the Western property, of, Western property line to create more openness from the adjacent property. We addressed massing and architecture by changing the number of buildings on site, the location of the buildings, as well as the materials proposed for the exteriors. As you can see in orange on the plan, we are conveying 1.23 acres of EP lands, as well as the existing trail system through that section to the town for public ownership at the request of NVCA, and we have now reached an agreement with them. Next slide, please. Focusing on the rental apartment side, we are proposing to construct three four-story rental apartment buildings with a total of 187 units with a mix of one and three bedroom suites, ranging in size from 680 square feet to 1500 square feet. Skydev's typical unit sizes are larger than average and one of our competitive advantages. Adjacent to the new Cranberry Trail connection to the southwest of the property, we're proposing a spacious indoor-outdoor amenity facility, offering picturesque views and a variety of amenities. As with all of our new developments, we include electric vehicle charging stations throughout the parking lots, as well as on-site bicycle parking. Underground parking includes a dedicated storage locker at the end of each parking space for convenience for when residents return home from skiing, a place to store their recreation equipment, and of course, we all need room for that Christmas tree. The rental apartments will have full-time on-site property management to ensure the property is maintained and looks first class. In addition, Skyland requires year-long leases for all tenants in our properties. Next slide, please. Here's a rendering of our development as we envision it once constructed. Next slide, please. 
And here's some building renderings, top left and bottom right, are examples of how the apartment buildings will look when finished with high quality gray and off-white masonry, wood accents around the windows, balconies, large windows, and patio doors. Top right is the proposed condominium townhouse units with complementary exterior finishes. And I will now pass it back to Carrie. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. Of the available 1,834 SDUs, the rental apartment portion of the development would require 125 SDUs. Apartments are the highest servicing efficiency of all housing types, and that coupled with our high efficiency fixtures and monthly consumption reporting to tenants creates the most optimal environment for conscientious water use. Next slide, please. And servicing efficiency is just one of the boxes that our rental housing project checks off on our exemption request. The project will provide numerous community and economic benefits. Number one, both permanent and construction jobs associated with the project. Increased environmental benefits through the conveyance of the 1.23 acres of environmentally sensitive lands, as well as the creation of trails. Providing much needed rental housing, such that we can improve the lives of those most affected by the pandemic. Our development will directly provide affordable housing uh, to the community. Next slide, please. The town's official plan makes reference to the CMHC criteria for affordable housing. This criteria requires that more than, no more than 30% of a household income is to be spent on housing needs. Based on this criteria, over 20% of the rental apartments will be affordable. With a median monthly income of just over $7,000, we will have both one and two bedroom options available at the below the 30% household income level. When households have a reasonable percentage of their income going towards housing needs, this allows them to buy better food, save money for home ownership, and in general, lead happier lives. And with that, I'd like to look ahead to next steps on the next page. We'd like to work with staff to quickly finalize our plans, incorporating any final comments that they might have on our resubmission that occurred in March. And we ask that approval for our vacant lands condo and council approval of our entire site plan and exemption approval for the rental housing component be approved. We hope that this overview provides you with increased details surrounding our application and we'd be happy to answer any additional questions that you have. And we look forward to moving ahead soon and providing rental housing that is affordable to the average household in Collingwood. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Well, thank you, Carrie and Lorraine. Uh, would any of the committee members like to pose questions of our deputants? Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you uh, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, Carrie, you were mentioning that uh, you would not be permitting Airbnb um, in these apartments, um, only longer term rentals. Uh, will there be any control in the rental agreements uh, to prevent subletting uh, for short term accommodation? Yeah, I mean, we certainly have a validation process for any of our uh, tenancies um, that come through. And uh, we uh, have a screening process that, of course, uh, takes into account many factors, and that includes for subletting. Thank you. Um, I also noted that you have a uh, renewable energy subsidiary. Uh, and I'm wondering if you are planning on incorporating uh, any elements of, um, of uh, your production there uh, to these apartments? So it's not part of our initial build concept. Um, you know, right now there's so many rebates available when you do it as a retrofit that it, it, it in fact is uh, sometimes better for you to do it as a retrofit to add solar panels on the roof versus doing it all up front. But what we will do is we'll make sure that the structure is designed to take that additional weight of the solar panels on the roof. We put conduits in place such that any of the electrical work uh, can easily be done to add them on. Terrific. And uh, just one more chair, if I may. Um, your request for 125 SDUs, um, when would you actually be um, anticipating uh, hookup? 
So if we were to receive uh, council approval for our site plan and exemption in July, we would start construction this fall. And that would mean our first occupancy would be in the spring of 2023. And is there an opportunity for phasing? Um, so certainly we see better construction pricing when we tender all three projects together, or sorry, the three buildings all together. And we have the foundation crew go from one to the next to the next. And so our vision here would be to construct all of the buildings because it provides us with the best costing and therefore the, the, the cheapest rental rates. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Doherty. Uh, any other questions? No, seeing none. Well, thank you. And I'm sh I know staff will have been listening uh, carefully to your presentation and uh, we'll take this up at a, at a later date. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Good night. Okay, the next item on our agenda is to hear updates on our interim control bylaw. And I see the first one would be on our water capacity, if that's correct, from Director Sloan. Yes, CAO Skinner, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. For efficiency reasons, I will uh, run quickly through the updates on 6.1 and 6.2, if that's okay with, uh, with you, Chair. And then we have Director Slama and Interim Director Glenn uh, both here to uh, answer any detailed questions. And there is a... Uh, a short deck um, uh, provided uh, for uh, the committee's uh, information as we go through these. And the uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick reminder on slide two that there was a resolution from council that there's a number of elements that should be updated uh, to the community um, at each uh, opportunity. And all of those items are included in the deck tonight. And slide three, uh, I just want to remind everyone of the situation. So we do have a current water supply that is safe and available. And um, for those that might not be aware of our difficult situation, I want everyone to know that council took a very proactive and transparent approach to seek further capacity. And um, uh, from a staff perspective, I can certainly attest that council's been very, uh, uh, very firm on that desire to seek further capacity, both from other municipalities and uh, from our plant itself. And also to uh, manage responsibly that is remaining as an exceptionally high priority. So with our chlorine maximized uh, at the plant under the uh, Ministry of the uh, um, Environment, Conservation and Parks requirements, uh, we do have several years of growth available but not enough to go all the way to the 2025 plant expansion um, at the current rates. Uh, so we had to do some chlorine adjustments to get that those years of growth and to push, push the boundaries. And it doesn't quite get us all the way that we want to go, although we're still hopeful. Uh, so council used an interim control bylaw upon the recommendation of staff to temporarily and transparently pause most development so that we were able to grow as a complete community. And we recommended this to, uh, to council so that they were able to look at the town over the next four years as we got that, that large expansion of the water treatment plant in place and to make these uh, the, the, uh, the fully informed decisions that we want them to make, to be able to make and, and to be able to hear from our development community and our residents uh, like they're doing tonight. Uh, we have started a land use policy study, We're, and you'll hear about an update of that shortly. We are accelerating construction of the new plant and our interim solutions, and we're seeking the water from other municipalities. And we just want to assure residents that there is a lot of work continuing. So work that doesn't use much more water, such as most reno residential renovations and additions can continue. And um, uh, there's an exemption process that I'll get into in a moment. Uh, slide four, please. So first I'll go through water capacity. Next slide. This is Director Slama's area. And since the last update, we have received the request for proposals from engineering consultants for the design of the water treatment plant. This is a massive project um, 
the actual plant, not the design part of the plant, but the actual construction of the plant, we're looking at somewhere in the range of $60 million. Um, it closed on June 10th. We were pleased that there were four submissions received and the evaluation is underway. Uh, we have a skilled team from a number of departments all participating in that. And uh, it does allow us to also interview the proponents. So we will be availing ourselves of that option. Uh, we are, uh, uh, per the direction from council, uh, undertaking a third party review, um, independent third party skilled review of if we have in fact uh, maximized our chlorine options. Uh, so we're reaching out to consultants and receiving proposals on that front. Uh, with respect to the new Tecumseh MT, new Tecumseh agreement, uh, we've been meeting to review the water supply. Uh, we have met last week to review the water supply calculation rate. That will be a big uh, one part of the new water supply agreement. And this week we'll be meeting at the CAO level to uh, continue to uh, negotiate the agreement itself. And uh, we are sending some letters just to be clear with New Tecumseh and Town of Blue Mountains uh, about the requests uh, from the town uh, regarding a reduction of their water supplies and asking them to uh, search their capabilities uh, to uh, contribute to the solution of this problem. Slide six, please. Uh, so Director Slama and her staff have provided this drinking water treatment plant expansion So we uh, uh, steps. So we uh, thank them for that. And I'm very pleased to say in the bottom left, we're now two steps up this uh, multi-step ladder and the RFP engineering design has closed. And the next step in July will be to award that engineering design. Uh, mean, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the remaining water supply, this is a cumulative summary and uh, it's uh, developed collaboratively between the building department, uh, the environmental services department uh, and the uh, planning department. So right now you'll see we have uh, 400 building applications received this year. And um, as you go down the numbers, I think some of the most important ones uh, are the SDU, a single dwelling unit equivalence of water uh, status. That's the middle part of the chart. And so since the last, uh, uh, at the last time of the last update, Council had approved um, some exemptions from the ICBL for work that was imminent to start immediately this summer. Uh, so there was, uh, we're at about, uh, we're at exactly 863 remaining single dwelling units worth of water. And that includes all the building permits issued to date um, and any ICBL exemptions. And I will note that that's for winter. Winter is our current constraint uh, for water. So that 863 is in winter. Uh, but for completeness, um, the technical staff have included at the bottom of the chart the available summer uh, uh, capacity and the remaining summer um, units. Uh, so this becomes a little complicated, but you can just think in the summer, uh, there's more water available, but people do use more water in the summer as well. So you have to look at both the summer and winter scenarios. And we have included, per the note number two at the bottom, the town's projects in the summer water use, um, but not in the winter because they're all seasonal projects, but they have been completed. Uh, included. Next slide, please. Uh, on the planning side, we have the land use planning policy study, which is the one that we are pausing uh, during the interim control bylaw to complete. Next slide. So uh, this is a very important note for the public and for developers. So with the help of our clerk's office and our communications uh, off, uh, manager, uh, we are want to make sure that everybody know, knows uh, that we are seeking formal exemption requests. Um, we appreciate the development community having submitted uh, uh, their exemption requests. And we also want to remind anybody in the community that has uh, desire to do um, construction such as building on an infill lot or perhaps uh, creating an apartment within their house that they should also submit by June 18th, which is the deadline. 
And um, uh, the application form is not complicated. It's easy to find on the town website, or if you call the town, we'll make sure that you can, you can get a copy. And um, I think there are about 18 submissions to date, and we'll be reporting back uh, with complete information to council for their, uh, to committee and council in, uh, in July for their decisions. We've selected the preferred planning consultant for the land use planning study and are just uh, notifying that person executing the documents and there'll be a kickoff meeting next week. Uh, the uh, exemption approvals that are in place are the ones that have been uh, approved by council recently. And uh, I'd already talked to you about the status of building permits, which I believe was on page seven. Slide 10, please. Oh, uh, so uh, I did have breaking news. Uh, not as only have there been 11 additional requests. Uh, there were 18, 18 between the time we published this uh, uh, material and, uh, and right now. And we do expect that more will come in before the deadline. Next slide, please. So uh, we're just in the throes of, of finalizing this uh, 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 sign up of the consultant and next we'll kick off the study. And as I mentioned uh, at the last uh, meeting, we will have a more comprehensive set of dates once we, uh, we do the kickoff with the consultant because their, their approach uh, did, will include uh, specific dates. And I know that everybody's very interested in ending the interim control bylaw. So we've said it's up to one year and I'm hoping that uh, we can confirm um, uh, expected actual timing uh, uh, within uh, two weeks. Next slide. And uh, with that, I will uh, end my update. And if you have questions uh, at the pleasure of the chair and myself or one of the technical experts will answer those, thank you. Oh, thank you for that update, uh, CEO Skinner. Uh, would any of the committee members like to pose questions? Vice Chair Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. Just by way of an update to the council's last decision and amendment with respect to the UV options going forward and how that impacted the RFP, could we have an update as to where that will land in terms of us being updated again? Who would like to answer that? Director Slama, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so through yourself to Councillor Jeffrey. So that has that was incorporated into the RFP for the the water treatment plant expansion. So we'll need to uh, determine who the successful candidate, the successful engineering team is for that project, and uh, and have um, our conversation, have our initial conversation with them about that first uh, task that they're uh, there to complete. So I don't have a I don't have a date right now. No, that's great. Uh, through the chair, thank you. And I have another question, unless the CEO has comments specific to that. CEO Skinner. Thank you. And I believe Director Slama, once the kickoff occurs, could you confirm? I think the contract required a quick turnaround uh, on the UV assessment. Is that correct? Thank you through the chair. Yes, it did. We had requested a six week turnaround. So, okay. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. And I just thought it was important for the public to have um, the information on all, all the balls we have in the air. Um, so my, my next question too, I mean, we've heard a lot about affordable and attainable housing. We have the task force. Uh, we have developers interested in that type of housing, but um, we also have our own properties. Does the town of Collingwood have to place some kind of placeholder or place card for a potential project for it uh, to um, keep some of the SDUs for its affordable housing initiatives? Who would like to answer that? Cassie Hoskinner. Thank you, Chair Hamlin, and through your, you to Vice Chair Jeffrey. Um, that's a great question, and uh, I think that um, the way that we have, uh, we set out in the last report to committee and council about the um, uh, exemption process is there's really two parts, well, really three parts to this. One is during the land use planning study itself. 
So the current exemption process is really about things that are very important to the community and will be or, or need an allocation of water within you know, the year that we're in right now. There's a set, set uh, of uh, about four years following that when um, uh, we won't have the new plant, but we'll have the outcome of the study. Potentially it could be a water allocation framework or something else and probably a well at water allocation framework and something else, but I don't wanna prejudge what the study may show up, show. And then the third space is after the plant is, is, is developed and potentially there's a lot more water available. So what staff had suggested to council is that we, we look at the water as a whole. So the amount that's allocated right now as part of an exemption to the ICBL process be you know, within the amount potentially that you would use in one of the, the four years. So if we think that affordable housing will be connected, for example, within the next year or 18 months, then yes, we should use and leave an allocation for it. Otherwise, notionally, uh, we could leave an allocation for it in the period after the ICBL is complete. So I think that that potentially works better with the timing it would take to build um, affordable housing right now that we look at from you know, mid 2022 onward as that placeholder as opposed to right now up to mid 2022. And so that was a good suggestion and we can, uh, we can work that into our thinking. Uh, thank you. I have a follow-up on that question uh, to you, CAO Skinner. Um, I understood what you were saying about mid-2022, but will there be more water available at that date? Is that, a, what, that something that we'll be able to count on to if, if we're deferring? If we assume we'll have some affordable housing projects on town on land, or at least one by then, um, how, how will we get water at that date? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. And uh, I'll start this. And if there's anything to be added, I'm sure Director Salama has, has all the numbers. Um, uh, based on the technical analysis, uh, there's somewhere around nine, I think believe the number was 948 single units that could be allocated between now and the, the, the plant expansion. Um, and then should the UV option or another option such as a chlorine contact tank be available as an advanced construction, there could be another uh, around um, eight or 900 units available at that time. So the intention would be with the exemptions this year to the, the report I think said 250 or 250 ish units so we wouldn't be using up all of our units right now. The idea would be that as with an eye to a complete community, that council would use them up as they saw fit using the criteria that come out of the study. So you wouldn't have necessarily a, a, a guarantee of more water, but you wouldn't have used it all up on year one either. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Would anyone else have any questions uh, concerning this uh, update? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. And the next item on the agenda are staff reports. So the first one we have is uh, P2021-16, and this relates to 308 7th Street site plan for a, a minor adjustment to a site plan control for a detached garage. Interim Director, Ron Glenn. Can you, I have, see I have a card from Deputy Clerk yeah. Dahl. Go ahead. Sorry, Chair Hamlin. I don't believe that they were done with item six on the agenda. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Was there, did I miss something there? Director Slama, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. Yeah, we have um, Manager McGinnity here and she was just going to provide uh, an update on the water conservation measures. And that was item 6.3. So okay. If you could move forward with that presentation, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Heather. Thank you, Director Slama. So 
As the town continues to grow, the water department has been promoting water conservation to help preserve our water resources. And there are three main categories of water usage that can be targeted through water conservation and efficiency programs. They're residential, ICI or institutional, commercial and industrial and unaccounted for water. So the town's water conservation initiatives touch on each of these categories. And this presentation will provide a brief overview of the initiatives and successes to date, as well as highlight some of our future plans. So next slide. Um, so the town's water use bylaw limits lawn watering to alternating days and based on the municipal street address. So even numbered houses can water on even days and odd numbered houses can water on odd days. This helps raise awareness that lawns don't need to be watered every day and also helps flatten out peak summer demands in the water system by not having everyone water their lawns on the same day. The town's low flow toilet rebate has been in effect since around 2008. Old toilets can use over 20 liters of water per flush compared to the newer four to six liter flush models. Homeowners proactively replacing old toilets can apply for two or up to two $50 rebates when they install a new low flush model toilet. This program has been very successful and we continue issue approximately 50 rebates per year. The town's water main leak detection program targets unaccounted for water or water loss in the system. As water distribution systems age, they deteriorate and become prone to leaks. Not all leaks rise to the surface quickly, so a leak detection program can identify leaks before they escalate to an emergency water main repair. Leaks are located using electronic acoustical listening equipment, and this takes place at night on water mains, hydrants, valves, and curb stops. System-wide leak detection occurs every other year in town, and identified leaks are subsequently scheduled for repair by our water distribution team. Next slide. From an ICI perspective, the town is fortunate to have a small non-potable water system to supply some industrial customers on the east side of town. While it only services a small area of town, it does provide those industrial properties with an opportunity to use cheaper, non-potable water for production processes. This means less demand on our drinking water system and results in less energy and chemical usage while providing the required water for these facilities. The quench buggy, while not promoting water conservation specifically, does encourage environmentally responsible choice for drinking water when attending events. Attendees can refill their water bottles instead of buying single use plastic water bottles. And most recently, our new water rate structure has been implemented to promote residential conservation. The increasing block rate structure is designed to penalize high water users in the hope that these users would identify opportunities within their homes to conserve more and bring their monthly total usage to the lower per cubic meter rate. Separate from the town-led initiatives, updates have also been made to the building code such that new construction must install fixtures that use less water, for example, low flow toilets. This is resulting in new homes typically having lower water usage requirements than older homes in town. Next slide. The results of residential water conservation are evident when we look at our historical metered water usage. The blue vertical columns show total metered residential consumption in Collingwood each year for the past 15 years, while the dark blue, dark blue dotted line shows the consumption trend. As shown by the trend line, water consumption has remained relatively stable, with some annual fluctuations likely driven by lawn watering and high or low precipitation years, although further analysis would be required to confirm this. Despite this steady water consumption rate, the town's population has increased over the past 15 years, from 17,290 in 2006 to almost 25,000 in 2020. And this 2020 population is estimated based on our 2016 census data and population forecast from the official plan. Next slide. When you translate this water consumption into a per capita demand use, you can see a fairly steady decline in average daily consumption per person between 2006 and 2016 or 2017. However, this declining trends appears to have leveled off in the past four to five years. So what does this mean? Well, the previous slide showed our total annual residential consumption remained relatively stable for the past 10 to 15 years. We now expect to see that additional increases in population will result in a noticeable increase in our total water, drinking water supply requirements in the coming years. 
This is likely the result of exhausting the limits of our existing residential water conservation programs. Next slide. So what are we doing? In 2021, we're looking to pilot a rain barrel program. We're working out logistics to establish a program to sell rain barrels to residents at a wholesale rate. The town would buy these rain barrels in bulk and store them at our water operations center and schedule a delivery one day per week to, uh, to residents who purchase a rain barrel. This will likely require coordinated effort with the customer service team at town hall to process payments and track purchases. We're also looking to raise more awareness about the importance of water by promoting the Stockholm International Water Institute World Water Week in August 2021. This year's theme is building resilience faster. And it relates, um, talks about the water impacts as it relates to climate crisis, poverty, and our loss of biodiversity. We'll be creating a display for the town hall window, launching a social media blitz, and also reaching out to our Healthy Kids coordinator to see about getting water education as part of the summer camp programs. We're also looking to create or establish a water conservation and efficiency plan. And this will identify and develop an implementation plan that will further improve water conservation and efficiency in town. This plan could include things such as district metering as another way to identify water loss in our distribution system, implementing in-home water audits to help residents with high water usage identify opportunities to reduce their water bills, promoting drought tolerant landscaping that does not require the same amount of watering as traditional gardens and lawns, a toilet flapper replacement program, so issuing rebates for people repairing leaky water, leaky toilets, which is high water usage um, in town, usually unexpected, creates unexpectedly high water bills. And also coordinating with our building department to promote gray water or gray water reuse or rainwater harvesting as part of new building construction projects. This is something that has been demonstrated successfully in both provincial and local projects. And as discussed earlier, there's also this pending land use planning study, the outcomes of which may have implications on how drinking water will be used in new developments and how these developments will be prioritized in the town. Next slide. So while it's difficult to quantify the impacts of any one conservation initiative, it's evident the town has had historical success with its residential water conservation efforts. But continued investment and innovation is required so that we get beyond our current plateau that we have reached in our residential water conservation. So thank you very much, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, um, Manager Mukinti. That was uh, very interesting. Okay, good. <laughs> the analysis and also the next steps that uh, that you and your staff have in mind. So thank you for that. Are there any questions uh, from the committee members? Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Hamlin. And uh, just uh, a uh, comment uh, uh, in, in endorsing actually your uh, support for this, this uh, presentation. It really was uh, very, uh, interesting and it, it it really does reflect the degree to which our residents have really grabbed on to the notion of sustainability at least when it comes to water and um, and how it has uh, allowed us to uh, um, I guess it it's good it's great thank you <laughs> just lost my thought there thanks Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, now, are we done on the interim control bylaw update? Yes, we are. Okay, on to staff reports again. So 7.1 was the uh, 7th Street uh, site plan control minor adjustment for a detached garage. And over to interim uh, director Ron Gunn for his overview. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm going to give just a brief uh, introduction and overview, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Justin and the planning department that's been working actively on the file to kind of take you through the nuts and bolts of it. But it is a site plan control approval uh, that staff is recommending. Uh, it is a minor uh, consideration to a property that does not have a site plan control agreement in place today. Uh, so at that, Justin, uh, I'll let you take them through the, uh, the application. Uh, and where it is in the nature of the application, then we'll entertain questions from the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Justin, are you there? Yep. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Excellent. All right, so uh, this is a report for a minor site plan uh, control application for a detached uh, garage accessory to an existing apartment building located at 308 7th Street. In summary, staff are recommending council approve the application as a minor adjustment uh, and the associated drawings finding that a full agreement in this instance would provide little benefit. Next slide, please. The proposal is to demolish the existing single-story detached garage located in the southwest corner of the site and rebuild on generally the same footprint, a new two-story detached garage to provide the owner with covered parking and storage for maintenance equipment. No habitable space is proposed in the garage or, or above. Section 3.B of the Interim Control Bylaw provides for construction of an accessory building or structure while the bylaw is in effect. Next slide, please. And this side just uh, provides elevations of the proposed uh, detached garage. And that concludes my presentation. And I'll pass it back to Chair Hamlin. Thank you very much for that. Uh, are there um, any questions or comments from the public before the committee considers this report? Uh, Teacher Hamlin, if there's anyone wishing to speak to the committee tonight about the staff report, if you could please raise your hand. And it looks like there's no one wishing to speak to this item. Okay, thank you. Would any of the members of the committee have any uh, questions or comments? Oh, wait, I have to read in the motion first. Allow me. The staff report P2021-16, 308 7th Street Site Plan Control Minor Adjustment for a Detached Garage be received and the council approve the processing of the proposed detached accessory building is a minor adjustment to site plan control agreement and the council approve the site plan development drawings for the proposed detached accessory building municipally addressed as 3087 street subject to the following conditions receipt of the following materials to the satisfaction of the director of planning and that would be five sets of final drawings for signature as well as resolution of any related matters is deemed appropriate to the satisfaction of the Director of Planning. Uh, and can I have a mover and a seconder, please, for that? That would be Vice Chair Jeffrey, Deputy Mayor Hall, thank you. Okay, now I can ask the Standing Committee if they have any questions or comments. Okay, seeing none, I in fact have one. I had the opportunity to uh, speak to our Interim Director, uh, Glenn, this morning. Uh, and it would appear there's a bit of a gap in our procedures or perhaps our site plan control bylaw uh, such that we need to create, uh, oh, I'm going to call it a fiction of sorts when we're asked to approve a, mi a minor change um, that would be an amendment to a site plan control agreement when in fact there is no site plan control agreement. So what I'm going to ask for support from the committee uh, for uh, is a report back from staff to this committee in September uh, on our site plan control bylaw and procedures as to whether any changes or alternatives would be recommended. Uh, would there, do you have any uh, comments on that in term, Director Glenn? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, and um, this is a situation that the building probably existed prior to site plan control. So when you do get alterations uh, or minor changes to the site, uh, then site plan kicks in because site plan control applies. And there may be a situation in the bio that we should be taking a look at to make sure that um, we cover off um, the alterations to the site that may be paramount to the site itself and the building or to accessory buildings. I just want to give staff an opportunity to take a look at the bylaw to see if there's improvements that we could make to address situations like this going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, would there be any uh, questions uh, from the committee about my proposal? No. So, Deputy Clerk, all we have to vote on this at this point. I, is that right? If you're requesting direction from staff, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Jeffrey, did you want to? Say something. No, are are we adding that, or is that separate from? Have we voted on the Seventh Street one yet? No, not yet. That would, be, that would be. We should vote on that first, and then. That's right. 
Okay, let's do that. Uh, I don't have any objections to that as as uh, as is before us, of course. All right. So, all in favor of the recommendation uh, that's before us? Thank you. That's approved unanimously. And then, with respect to my staff report suggestion. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, I am just looking at the procedural bylaw and you do require uh, not less than 24 hours prior to publishing the agenda for any staff report requests. So maybe this should be a notice of motion that we considered at the next council meeting. Sure. Okay, consider it a motion, notice of motion. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, so the next staff report before us is uh, item 7.2. This is uh, P2021-17, Radio Communications Tower Proposal for 25 Sanford Fleming Drive and 28806 line. Uh, and again, Interim Director Glenn, could I turn this over to you for your uh, report? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, I'm going to give a brief overview of it, and then the uh, planner that has been working through these files is Justin again, and he will take you through the specifics of it, but it is for, um, we had a number of applications, three, but then down to two formal applications for a radio communication tower in the town. Uh, we have uh, concluded our review, and you'll notice that it's not a recommendation of endorsement. Um, but it's a concurrence sent back to the federal government with regards to how we approach these. One of the towers we're supporting, one of the towers we're not supporting, uh, and Justin will take you through that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Over to you, Justin. All right. Okay. So uh, in late 2019, the town received three pre-consultation proposals for radio communication towers in the area of Sanford Fleming Drive and Sixth Line, uh, approximately within 500 meters of one another. Two of those proposals made formal applications, one for 25 Sanford Fleming Drive and the second for 2880 Sixth Line. Staff have reviewed these two applications against the town's radio communications protocol and the expectations that we outlined uh, through pre-consultation, including that the town would only support uh, one tower in this area in such close proximity. Both proposals have completed the public consultation required by the town's protocol. Next slide, please. Shared, um, oh, missing. try the next one. And go back, sorry, I think there's a slide maybe missing. Or it jumped. Try going back one slide, please. Back one more. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so Shared Telecom Canada or STC is proposing a 45 meter shrouded monopost, monopole style tower at 25 Sanford Fleming Drive, which is the tower shown on that slide on the left. Signum Wireless is proposing a 40 meter shrouded uh, tripole tower at 28806 line. Uh, the elevations and renderings for the 28806 line proposal show a 35 meter tower. However, public notice and a request was ultimately made for a 40 meter tower of the same design. Staff have reviewed the submissions against the town's protocol and prefer the location design and justification submitted for 25 Sanford Fleming, finding it to be more set the more sensitive proposal. Staff are therefore recommending a concurrence be given for this tower and a non-concurrence be given for the proposal for 2806 line. Staff are satisfied that the proposed height of the tower at 25 Sanford Fleming is reasonable for this specific location, <clears throat> and that it will facilitate co-location of multiple carriers and improve service. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide shows two renderings of the proposed tower at 25 Sanford Fleming Drive. So the one that concurrence is being recommended for. So you can see it's the uh, shrouded monopole. So it essentially looks like a, a large white um, flagpole almost. Next slide, please. And this slide shows renderings of the proposed tower for 2806 line. Um, so the tripole, so it's got three supporting um, posts below and then a shrouded at the top. Um, and this is the tower that uh, staff are recommending non-concurrence for. Next slide, please. Uh, and this slide shows the existing and proposed coverage analysis provided by STC for the submission at 25 Sanford Fleming. So the darker blue and purple areas uh, show good coverage. Um, so that's got the before uh, on the left and then the uh, 
estimated coverage on the right. So that concludes uh, my presentation. I'll pass it back to Chair Hamlin. Okay, thank you. Um, would there be any members of the public who wish to comment or ask questions? I'll call to the public. If there's anyone wishing to speak, if you could please raise your hand. And it doesn't appear anyone wishes to speak to this item this evening. Okay, so I'll read in the uh, recommendation here. That staff report 2021-17 radio communications tower proposals, 25 Sanford Fleming Drive and 28806 line be received. And that council approve a concurrence for the radio communications tower proposed at 25 Sanford Fleming Drive to be provided to Industry, Science and Economic Development Canada. And further the council approve a non-concurrence for the radio communications tower proposed at 28806 line be provided to Industry Science and Economic Development Canada. Could I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Vice Chair uh, Jeffrey and Councillor Dewar. Uh, would the Standing Committee have any questions or comments about the staff report? Mayor Saunderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just so I'm clear, uh, through you to uh, either uh, Acting Director Glenn or uh, uh, Planner Tickle, um, as I understand it, we've got two options and uh, we are going to be making a, a recommendation on behalf of one of those options to, uh, to um, Industry and Science and Economic Development Canada and a recommendation against the other one. And we're recommending uh, the one in Sanford Fleming uh, because we feel it'll be less intrusive um, and less visible, uh, but also uh, we recognize that uh, the uh, tower is necessary because there's a gap in our service and this tower, either of the towers, will uh, create, I gather, a one kilometer radius uh, from where it's located to help fill that gap. Is, is that right? Yes, over to you, uh, Planner Tico. Well, uh, through the chair uh, to the mayor, uh, that's correct. Um, so the municipality, as the, uh, the land use authority, um, issues a concurrence or non-concurrence to Industry Science Canada, um, and they uh, take those into consideration in uh, issuing their authorization um, for tower infrastructure. Um, and from the submissions provided, my understanding is that generally um, the, the best coverage or the, the I guess, um, more perfect coverage, if you will, will be a one kilometer radius. I think if you look at that coverage map, it will likely provide a service area beyond that, um, but it'll be reduced um, uh, service outside of that area. Okay, any, any follow-up to that, uh, Mayor Saunderson? Uh, just one follow-up, if I could, please. So our, our uh, recommendation of concurrence or out of concurrence, uh, is that determinative or will uh, the authority, the federal authority make up its own mind? So I think ultimately, um, Industry Science and Economic um, Development Canada has the final say in terms of uh, issuing authorization, but my understanding from speaking with them um, is that they do strongly rely on the concurrences um, that are issued by municipalities. So um, I would anticipate that uh, they would um, issue the authorization in line with the uh, municipal concurrence. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Vice Chair Jeffrey. Just to confirm that industry science will only be picking one location. There's not the potential for them to say, we'll take both. My understanding is that if the town issues a concurrence for one, and given that the both towers appear to be trying to service the same area, um, that I don't anticipate that industry science and economic development Canada would issue an authorization for both, but I can't say with certainty that they wouldn't have the ability to issue an authorization for both if they so chose. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Deputy Mayor Hall. Um, thank you. Through you to staff, and I apologize, I didn't have an opportunity to maybe ask this question in advance because I think it actually predates um, uh, all three of you in terms of our CAO and two members of the planning uh, department. Uh, from the outset of the term, we had an application on the west side of town on the 11th line and uh, that was, I think, referred back to staff uh, and hasn't come back to development and operations. 
I'm, the, I guess the question is twofold. One is that I'm making an assumption that this application is completely unique and not, um, uh, or is independent of that uh, application that came forward at the outset of the term. And I guess the second question, and it doesn't need to be answered this evening, would be just out of interest. I'd, I'd be curious to know what happened to that application. Thank you. Uh, Planner Tickle, is that something you'd like to use? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure which proposal it was specifically on 11th line. Um, the same company as one of these tower proposals has another proposal on the west side of town. Um, they have a formal application in for that. Um, and there's another uh, proposal at the pre-consultation stage. Um, but uh, both of like, those applications will be reviewed uh, individually on the basis, is, basis of the protocol and uh, reviewed independently from these proposals. Any follow-up to that, Deputy Mayor Hall? No, I guess the math is pretty simple. And given the radius that these are proposed, I mean, it, it doesn't affect one versus the other. So that's irrelevant. Uh, so I guess the question was more out of curiosity as to what happened to that original proposal, because we actually did have strong opposition from residents within that particular area. So, uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else uh, have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'd just like to say uh, I really appreciated the detail analysis that staff did on this report and uh, it was uh, really great. Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll have a vote on this then. All in favor? And that would be unanimous. Thank you. The next item is 7.3 um, and our vice chair Jeffrey has uh, graciously offered to uh, take the chair over for this uh, particular item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. So I guess I will turn it over to interim uh, director Glenn to um, tee up uh, the presentation for this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, I'm gonna do a short introduction. This is a report to deal with three draft plan approval extensions. Uh, you heard a presentation earlier this evening about one of them at Panorama. Uh, there's two other uh, extensions uh, that are also being considered. Um, their lapsing dates are in June. Um, I've asked Mark Bryan of our planning department that's been working extensively on these extensions to make a uh, presentation to you. You also have received a number of uh, requests and letters from the proponents um, with regards to the conditions in the draft plan of subdivision that at the appropriate time, Madam Chair, would be glad to speak to. So Mark, if you could go ahead. Okay, thank you. Very good. So Extensions of draft plan approval for the Bridgewater, Panorama, and Lynx View um, subdivisions. Next slide, please. Um, the first one is Bridgewater, also known as the Preserve at Georgian Bay. It's located in the northwest quadrant of the town um, at 11644 and 11700 Highway 26 West. Next slide, please. Um, this consists of um, so it's a 37.2 hectare um, parcel with one large medium density block, which is 11.9 hectares in size. And that's pretty much the dead center of what you're looking at right now. And that's proposed for 320 residential units, um, 71 of which are singles, 82 townhouses and 162 apartments in three buildings. There is also a 0.9 hectare block for high density adjacent to Highway 26. And um, surrounding these blocks um, are numerous environmental protection blocks. And um, those blocks are to protect provincially significant wetlands and provide buffers between the development areas and the wetlands. Um, the lands are designated and zoned for these uses and densities. And um, additionally, it's noted that there are several applications in process right now. Uh, to revise the plan of subdivision. So revise the draft approved plan of subdivision and also 
um, rezone the properties and those applications are, are not being considered tonight, but they were subject of a public meeting in 2019. And um, at present, the applicant is now requesting an extension of four years. Next slide, please. The next subdivision to be considered is the um, Panorama or previously known as Mayor Mills Village. Um, it's located at the southwest corner of Mountain Road and 10th Line. Um, and it consists of a 19.82 hectare parcel. And you can see that it's uh, adjacent to um, the Agnora plant um, with the uh, Side Lounge Brewery and a number of other subdivisions. Uh, the Mayor Mills Estate subdivision, which has been constructed the Red Maple um, subdivision, which is also draft approved, and down in the um, um, bottom right-hand side is the Georgian Meadows subdivision. It's north of the Blue Mountain Golf and Country Club and south of the Panorama North proposed subdivision. Next slide, please. Um, this subdivision proposes 127 singles, primarily on the west half of the property, and 192 multiple units um, on the eastern portion of the property. And that uh, would consist of five townhouse blocks um, for street townhouses and a couple of uh, larger multi-res blocks, which could, um, which could have um, um, townhouses, stacked townhouses, apartments. Uh, there's also a local convenience block. And I know that Ms. Wells uh, already spoke to this. There's a um, local convenience block located at the northeast corner of the plan, just adjacent to the Mountain Road and 10th Line intersection. And at the southeast corner of the plan, there is a large block, which is, um, is to contain a stormwater management pond and um, a town park. Revisions were last made to this application in 2018. It also went through um, an application process where they proposed revisions to their plan of subdivision and rezoning. So similar to what uh, is now in process for the Bridgewater application. And of course, these lands are designated and zoned for these uses. And um, as referenced in the earlier presentation, um, there, have been, um, um, off, there have been efforts uh, underway to advance these approvals as well. Next slide, please. So lastly, we have the Lynx View plan of subdivision. I know this is a very busy aerial photograph and it's uh, not overly dissimilar to the one that Ms. Wells showed for the Mara Mills Village's uh, draft plan or panorama draft plan. So it's located to the west of Georgian Meadows, north of Fisher Field at 780, 788, the 10th line. And it consists of a 40.66 hectare property and that's for about 630 residential units. Next slide, please. Um, the plan as uh, currently um, draft approved would contain 39 singles and eight townhouses. And that's, um, you can see the, the fine wadding in the uh, eastern, northern and eastern portion of the plan. And uh, with the bulk of the lands being um, set up for 400 residential units, which could be a, a combination of singles, semis, and or towns. And uh, there are two apartment blocks. Well, one apartment block to the south and east, so the southeast corner across from uh, Georgia Meadows, um, which could yield up to 190 apartment dwelling units. And just to the west of that, there's a, a, a square-shaped block, which is proposed as a um, public school um, site. And were that uh, block not to um, be developed as a school, then it would be able to um, have upwards of 187 um, apartment units. There are um, park and open space blocks uh, um, throughout the plan. Uh, the lands also are designated and zoned. And um, with this one, a pre-consultation is underway for modifications to the proposal. Um, which would include um, a more detailed lotting plan for a lot of those uh, residential blocks and um, also would um, lessen the curvilinear pattern of, of many of the streets. It wouldn't establish a, a, um, a, a total grid, but it would um, soften or straighten out some of the, the um, curvilinear qualities. So all of these draft approved plans of subdivision uh, continue to have merit 
and extensions um, are warranted subject to modifications to the conditions of draft plan approval. And um, time has passed and the, the town is obviously experiencing um, uh, challenges right now and uh, there's a need to bring the conditions up to date. The um, plans are, um, they continue to comply with applicable provincial and municipal planning policy, including official plan designations and development specific zoning. Uh, these plans would help to advance needed servicing, uh, transportation and community infrastructure, and they would support additional residential and employment growth as we um, look to meet our population allocation of 33,400 in 2031. They are actively being pursued by the proponents and um, they were all generally supported for extension by internal and external review partners. The, okay, just, um, we don't need the presentation up anymore, but uh, just to close out here, the associated draft plan conditions can be modified to address current challenges and those uh, modifications have been included in the staff report and in the attached conditions of draft plan approval. And basically they deal with servicing capacity and allocation, urban design and architectural control guidelines. They um, include no pre-sales clauses, warning clauses, and construction and communication ma management plan requirements. And uh, they also include another condition which deals with those, um, with um, the residential blocks where the lotting pattern is not as yet known. And that would conclude the presentation. Thank you very much, Senior Planner Brian. Um, so Deputy Clerk, do we have anyone in the public gallery wishing to speak to these, uh, one of these three uh, proposed draft plan approval extensions. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Jeffrey. We have two people wishing to speak at this time. So the first one I'll call is Duncan Bristol. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can, Great. welcome. Uh, well, thank you. My name is Duncan Bristol and I'm representing the Blue Mountain Watershed Trust Foundation. I'd like to raise two points with respect to the current Bridgewater Development Extension request before you today. The first item involves the observation of an endangered spotted turtle at 164 Bartlett Boulevard on May 15th, 2019. This observation postdates both, both of the developers' environmental studies, which were carried out in 2007 and 2018. <clears throat> In light of this sighting, the Watershed Trust commissioned a paper study with North-South Environmental to look at the azimuth studies previously carried out by the developer. The azimuth study stipulated that the spotted turtle habitat did not extend beyond the Westlands, which are not being considered for development right now, and into the Eastlands, the subject of today's extension. The 2019 observation would tend to refute this finding. North-South Environmental Review is a detailed nine-page report and a copy has been forwarded to the town through the planning department. Key findings I'd like to share with you are, based on their review of the asthma studies, North-South Environmental states, additional analysis of the site for spotted turtle are, are required. The previous studies are lacking in details about environmental conditions at the time of the survey so that the results can be accurately interpreted following the 2015 OMNR survey protocol for spotted turtle. This protocol would also require information such as surveyor names, qualifications, weather conditions at the time, and a map showing the survey locations and routes taken. The developer's EIS states, the proposed development leaves most of the study area in its existing naturally vegetated state. This statement does not, however, consider long-term impacts on the surrounding areas, such as encroachment, increased potential for introducing invasive species, increased presence of subsidized predators, increased potential for poaching and habitat trampling. It should be assumed People will access these natural areas for walking dogs, hiking, et cetera, unless mitigation is employed to specifically prevent these activities. 
encroachment of personalized gates and fences, ad hoc trails, dumping of garden waste and establishment of gardens or hangout areas are common long-term impacts on remaining natural areas which are adjacent to a development. This then brings me to the second point, which involves item 41. This is on page 32 of 69 in your attachment from planning. And this requires that the owner agrees to gratuitously dedicate blocks 11, 12, and 13 to the town. These are the wetland blocks of Silver Creek. We believe it's critically important to the survival of species such as the spotted turtle in this area that fencing be installed along the borders of these blocks, which fully prevents both human and animal, dogs, cats, etc., ingress. This will be an important along the western edge of the current development proposal as well, where azimuth environment themselves have noted the population of spotted turtle. As you likely know, the Blue Mountain Watershed Trust has been involved with this proposal since 2007 and entered into an OMB Minutes of Settlement Agreement with the developer at that time based on six stipulations. We, of course, will stand by these Minutes of Settlement given that the current extension request is for the original density agreed to in 2007. Our request at this time is for some additional study regarding the extent of the spotted turtle habitat. I very much appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bristow and um, Senior Planner Brian. Is there, you, I know you saw you taking notes and I'm sure you have the letter. Um, is there any response at this time? Um, yes, um, I think at this time, um, I'd say that we just received that um, that uh, additional material that Mr. Bristow um, referenced. Um, I haven't had a chance to go through it in, in detail yet, but uh, certainly will. Um, I guess in terms of uh, the spotted turtle impacts, um, I would make reference that we did circulate the draft approval extension to the Conservation Authority who indicated that they had no objection with the draft approval extension and they were um, satisfied with the draft plan conditions that uh, they've, they've relied on in the past. Um, additionally, in looking through the file, there um, I do have um, some um, uh, correspondence on file from the Ministry of, um, I guess it was Environment and Climate Protection or Conservation and Parks. That one uh, changes uh, seems by, the, by the month. Anyways, um, they had indicated that um, Generally, it, it appeared that the development area, um, they did not view the development area as being spotted turtle habitat, but they didn't rule out the possibility that the, the provincially significant wetlands could contain turtle habitat and that um, they were concerned about protection mitigation measures for potential areas of habitat. Uh, notwithstanding that the applicants, um, as I recall, the applicant's consultant was contending that this wasn't spotted turtle habitat and that the turtle had um, was um, out of its habitat at the time when it was um, sighted. So I guess the, the overall impression would be that, um, that it doesn't impact on the development limits or the developable areas and that there are those environmental buffers in place and that uh, any action in the future would need to address potential, um, would need to mitigate any potential impacts if turtle habitat were to be definitively established. Okay, uh, thank you for those comments, Mark. Um, and Mr. Bristow, um, staff have your letter and we thank you for taking the time to make your comments uh, today. You... Th thank you for your time. Yeah, take care, have a great evening. Uh, Deputy Clerk Dahl, uh, I think you said we had one more person who wished to present. Uh, that's correct. I have Larry Young who would like to speak. Thank you. Good evening, uh, members of committee, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Larry Young. I reside in Park, and uh, I presume you can hear me. Yeah, we just you just went in and out there briefly in the introduction. Okay, apologize for that. Again, my name is Larry Young. I reside at 100 Bartlett Boulevard in Collingwood. And uh, I just uh, want to uh, just make a few comments on the Bridgewater uh, um, uh, request for extension. 
and that uh, I do support uh, Mr. Bristow's position. Uh, I am concerned about the environment and the impact on the um, on the uh, uh, spotted turtle in this case. But uh, also, I just uh, just I request uh, uh, some time ago I've, I've I've communicated with planning and engineering with queries about the engineering and, and the status of the review of the developer's submissions to date and, and progress uh, with his various submissions uh, as he goes through the process, not just with this 320 uh, lot uh, proposal, but um, uh, with the uh, proposed uh, rezoning. And I know tonight's meeting has nothing to do with the rezoning, um, but it is uh, interconnected or interlinked. And uh, uh, as, as the developer moves forward through the process, um, things change from the initial public meeting and presentations of services, access, egress, um, and, uh, and parkland dedication and uh, all the other amenities that are, are, uh, are to be provided. But uh, I, I just wonder who I should direct my, my queries to uh, as, a, as an interested neighbor and, and, and resident. Uh, and uh, who should uh, re reasonably respond in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a timely manner. I, I presume that would be the planning department. And I know I've communicated in the past with Mr. Bryan, um, but um, I just want to uh, get clarification from committee that my inquiries are going to the right party. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, thank you for your comments. And I'll just confirm with uh, senior planner Brian that um where you should specifically be uh, sending your queries and who you will hear from. Uh, Mark? Uh, yes, Chair Jeffrey, um, at this point, um, it would be me as senior planner, uh, having carriage of the file. All right, Mr. Young, so uh, it uh, will be your planner, uh, Brian, that you would uh, forward, uh, put to attention directly. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Yes, you too. Okay, Deputy Clerk, one final check. If not, I'll read in the recommendation. Sure, I'll make a final call. So if there's anyone else wishing to speak to the staff report, please raise your hand. And it looks like there's no one else wishing to speak to the staff report. Okay, thank you. All right, so reading it in, uh, that staff report P2021-18, uh, draft plan approval extension requests be received. And further that council approve three year extensions of draft approval for the following plans of subdivision, including revisions to the associated conditions of draft plan approval as contained in this report with the draft approvals to lapse on June 29th, 2024. Bridgewater Residential Plan of Subdivision D1202121, Panorama, Mayor Mills Village Residential Plan of Subdivision D1202321, and Links to Residential Plan of Subdivision D1202221, and further that this report be considered at the June 21, 2021 meeting of Council. I have a mover and a seconder, please. Mayor Saunderson and uh, Chair Hamlin. Uh, are there any members of the committee wishing to ask question or make comment? Uh, Councillor Doherty and then Chair Hamlin. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, and uh, through you to uh, uh, probably both uh, um, Interim Director Glenn and uh, Senior Planner Brian. Um, uh, we, we have uh, received um, uh, comments from these three applicants just this afternoon uh, in inquiring as to the rationale for a three-year extension when our water treatment plant uh, is likely to be completed in a four-year time frame. Um, what is the rationale for three-year? Um, through the chair to Councillor Doherty. Um, the rationale for the three-year extension is that um, um, we want to have these uh, draft approvals come back in a timely manner so that they can be updated, revised as needed. Um, there are, well, obviously regulations, policies do change over time, and we thought that um, a three-year extension across the board for these three applications would be sufficient. Um, to allow these matters to be brought back and revised if necessary. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and then uh, my second question, um, we've also uh, received uh, comments just this afternoon uh, from two of the three um, expressing concern about uh, the uh, some of the new um, uh, terms and conditions uh, to satisfy um, uh, all to satisfy to satisfy the draft plan, um, and I'm just wondering. Uh, a number of them really focused on um, architectural design, arch architectural control. Um, conditions. And I'm wondering uh, what we are asking for, uh, is this uh, really an exceptional strategy in order to achieve better uh, urban design, um, better architectural design in our community? Um, again, through the chair, yeah, to our Councillor Doherty. Um, I think when we drafted those, um, those draft plan conditions or those modifications, they weren't viewed as being excessive. Um, they were viewed as um, as really sort of underscoring the, the transition that's been occurring over the past several years with the town. Um, we do have um, um, a greater emphasis on achieving higher quality urban design and those conditions as worded were seen as, as really backstopping the, those efforts. Um, I suppose, I suppose the only thing that, I, that I'd add uh, in addition to that is that um, the conditions do contain a fair amount of, of flexibility. Um, so I, I don't think that they're, I don't think that they're overly prescriptive or, or, um, or rigid. I think that there is room in there to work with applicants to ensure that they're reasonably implemented. Thank you. Uh, to be clear, I have no concern about those conditions, uh, and I was quite happy to see them. Um, are there uh, communities that you can think of, without putting you on the spot, uh, where uh, similar conditions might exist? Um, again, through the chair to Councillor Doherty, um, I have not had um, time to do an extensive survey of draft plan um, conditions and urban design in other municipalities. Um, but these, some of these conditions are based on, um, on uh, conditions that uh, Director Farr had forwarded to me that uh, were operational in the town of Halton Hills. Great. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. No, uh, no. <laughs> No, I have, I have a number of other questions. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, the so deputy clerk wants, sorry, Councillor Doherty, dep the deputy clerk has something to comment on. Okay, sorry. sorry. Uh, just interim director Glenn had his hand up there, so I wasn't oh, sure sorry. if he thank wanted you. to speak to that item. Yep. Through, through you, Madam Chair, and just an answer to uh, Councillor Doherty's question around uh, our urban design uh, guidelines used elsewhere uh, in draft plans of subdivision, yes, they are. Uh, in my previous, uh, Adam uh, and um, Mark made reference to Halton Hills. Uh, I can tell you that in Halton region, they're used widely with regards to urban design and plans of subdivision. Okay, uh, next question, Councillor Doherty. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, in regard to conditions um, that, um, um, the um, proponents will will need to uh, work through satisfying. I had uh, one uh, in particular uh, in regard to Panorama, um, and um, that was to um, ask the the street layout in Panorama. Pan, Panorama is um, fairly grid like uh, with. Um, uh, long, straight, uh, not a lot of curves in the roads, uh, and a couple of fairly long roads. And our learning uh, in our journey to better traffic uh, calming policies has suggested that uh, long, straight roads uh, are not likely to calm traffic. Uh, and may exacerbate uh, speeding and a reduction in, in safety for pedestrians and active transportation. Is there an opportunity at this time 
to um, uh, work with the developer to change those layouts or is it too far gone? And if so, can traffic calming elements be added at this point? Um, through the chair to Councillor Doherty, um, generally I'd say that this draft approved plan is pretty, it's pretty advanced. Um, this is um, the layout that the applicant would like to have. And um, I'm not, I understand your concerns um, as far as traffic calming goes and, and whatnot, but I think that given that these are all local roads, um, in my discussions with engineering services, uh, local roads are generally, they have volumes of traffic that are, are, are certainly less than collectors or arterials and so on. And that um, there wouldn't be as great a concern for, for traffic calming measures on roads like this or for an alteration of the configuration. Um, but I would say that uh, in the draft plan conditions, there are cert there's certainly room to, to look at traffic calming as part of how engineering services would envision the right of ways being, being uh, ultimately realized. Great. Thank you. Uh, similarly, I was disappointed uh, to hear that you would, um, or that uh, the Lynx View proponents were actually um, uh, planning to uh, reduce uh, the uh, curvilinear um, uh, shapes of, of their roads. I uh, hope they're not going to be too grid like. Um, with your um, Approval chair, I will move on to Bridgewater um, and I have a number of concerns uh, in regard to this um, request for extension. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, the significance of this application uh, cannot be forgotten in that it is adjacent to one of the last remaining provincially significant wetlands. And in the 14 years since this uh, application was uh, first um, approved for advancement via OMB decision, um, we have learned an awful lot about uh, how wetlands uh, contribute to protection of species at risk, um, how they um, improve uh, stormwater uh, and um, uh, storm swell absorption um, and how they have become a very effective carbon sink uh, when we are considering climate change mitigation. Uh, and so uh, along with the comments that we received tonight from uh, Mr. Brin Bristow, um, I am wondering if we will be requesting of this uh, applicant to update uh, their um, environmental impact studies. Senior Planner Brian. Um, thank you. Uh, again, through the chair to um, Councillor Doherty. Um, once we have a look at what has been submitted um, by the, the Watershed Trust, um, I think we can, we can um, have a discussion as to what that would entail whether that, and we talk to our um, review partners and whatnot, both internally and externally and determine whether that would precipitate any additional study work. But it's certainly a discussion that we would have. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, Chair, thank you for your deference. Yeah. Um, I will ask uh, when we vote on these items, if we can sever out Bridgewater. For sure, okay. Can do that. Um, and Chair Hamlin, I believe you had some comments or questions. Uh, yes, I had a few. Thank you. Um, firstly, uh, just with reference to the various pieces of correspondence in the presentation we received uh, from the various applicants, I'm wondering, uh, and I guess this would be a question through you, Madam Chair, to our senior planner, Brian, if these would all be appropriate to be referred to uh, staff uh, to come back to council next week 
when all or any of these will be dealt with by council with some comments. Okay, so Chair Hamlin, you're looking for an update or an amendment? No, I'm looking for a response. There were a number of uh, issues raised by these various applicants with respect to the conditions uh, at the last minute. We received various pieces of correspondence today. Uh, and I know staff hasn't had a chance to look at them, so I don't want to put them on the spot and ask them what they think. But I would ask if uh, it would be possible for them, for those things that we should hear comments on, to comment on them next Monday when this comes to council. Okay, and I'm, I'm just going to, I thought Councillor Doherty did ask through to Senior Planner Brian um, about uh, those um, questions in terms of the conditions and some of the new conditions, <laughs> I think. And, I think it was clearly stated that we felt they were broad enough to address with the, the applicants going forward their concerns. Um, if that's different, would Senior Planner Brian or Interim Director Glenn correct, <laughs> correct me? If I can just uh, comment before they answer, um, I believe Councillor Doherty addressed certain specific conditions, but that the requests made by these applicants were much broader um, than question asked. Okay. Like for example, I'll just throw one out. They asked for a generic um, management plan for how residents' concerns will be dealt with during the approval process. There, there were just there were just a lot of things in there. <laughs> okay. So all right. So I'm just gonna ask Senior Planner Brian and Interim Director Glenn to respond first and then we'll decide on a proper procedure going forward to have this get to council. So Madam Chair, um, uh, I'll address first and then Brian can add in. Uh, the staff recommendation that's been put forward is, has been put forward for the protection of the municipality and protecting its interest going forward with regards to the draft plans of subdivision. There have been a number of issues raised like the timing of the draft plan of subdivision, three years versus four years. Um, there's some in there that they don't like the no pre-sales clause uh, there's a comment in there. They don't like the construction works. They don't like the um, enhanced uh, urban design framework that the town wants to put inside the conditions. Uh, I think it would be appropriate um, for you to have a full picture for us to be able to prepare a response to those questions. But that doesn't change the nature of our recommendation with regards to the draft plans. But it may answer your questions with regards to the specifics uh, of some of those requests around um, things like no pre-sales agreements. Um, I can tell you that the last thing, if development isn't gonna happen within the, the period of time, you don't want them pre-selling and having a whole pile of future homeowners appearing at your council table saying, where's our water? Uh, that's one thing you don't wanna do. So those are the types of things that we're trying to put in the agreements that protect you as an interest in the municipality. I'm not sure, Brian, if you wanna, uh, or Mark, if you wanna add anything additional. Um, through the chair, um, I, I certainly think that um, you know a more wholesome response is something that that uh, can be done between now and and next uh, uh, Monday. Um, I guess what I'd be asking is if that's if it's expected that that would be incorporated into the report, or would um, the desire be that there's a, a report at the time that the the report comes forward for council's consideration. Uh, thank you. So I'll, I'll just check with um, Chair Hamlin, but uh, my understanding is then at this point, the more fulsome report is part of the report uh, as opposed to impacting the recommendation is yeah. what we'd be expecting. Exactly, thank you. Great, all right. So uh, Deputy Clerk, do we need, um, we don't need an amendment for that to ask staff for that more fulsome report in response to those uh, items listed by Interim Director Glenn. Uh, for you to the committee, I don't believe so. This is in response to the comments received. It's not asking for additional information from the committee. Okay, all right. Um, so further comments then, uh, Chair Hamlin? Yes, I have a few questions here. So um, with respect to Bridgewater, uh, 
One of the de deputants indicated uh, a request for fencing around the environmentally protected lands. And I know that's been raised uh, in previous meetings. And I'm just wondering if that is required as part of the conditions now. Um, just to respond to that, um, the conditions of draft plan approval for Bridgewater, I'm just going to hit on the first one that I see. Mm -hmm. and that would be under condition four, which um, it speaks to um, that the owner will enter into servicing development and other necessary agreements satisfactory to the town, the conservation authority, and so on. Um, these agreements may deal with matters including but not limited to, and item H speaks to fencing, berming, buffer blocks, and planting. So at the very least, I would see that condition as allowing us to address any fencing requirements that may be identified um, either through, um, um, you know, a, a siting of the, uh, an additional siting of the spotted turtle or any work that would, um, would, um, um, that could happen that looks at uh, habitat and any mitigation measures that are necessary. But the draft plan condition is sufficiently general that um, that, uh, that option would be available. Okay, because it just seemed to me that environmentally protected lands would, you know, could be protected better <laughs> if there were uh, fencing between the residential part of the development and uh, those lands. Um, my next question, I just really wanted to echo what uh, Councillor Doherty was saying about traffic calming, because, uh, you know, uh, with respect to Panorama, the road uh, there seemed to connect to Mare Mills and through to 10th Line, which will be a pretty direct uh, route and an alternative to Mountain Road, which we know will get incredibly busy over the uh, coming years. So I would uh, also ask uh, if this could be something that staff could have a look at um, or the applicant could have a look at, but and also for Link's view, the, the uh, road there is much in the nature of a Finley road with a lot of uh, feeder roads uh, going on to the main road. And uh, I would be really concerned that we don't have uh, residents in the future coming to this table to say, you know, can we have some traffic control and speed humps and <laughs> all the things we're now hearing from the, you know, other parts of our community, even newer subdivisions. Um, the um, other next issue I want to raise, it's sort of under the heading of, you know, what I'll call public realm. And where I'm coming from is in this area, as we saw from the uh, maps that were put up, there's, including Georgian Meadows, there'll be more than a few thousand uh, residences in this area as soon as, you know, development's allowed to proceed here. And I'm concerned that uh, there hasn't been enough coordination between these developments to make or that it will be safe uh, for pedestrians and cyclists in particular. And I'm concerned because this is a greenfield site, which means development hasn't happened here before. And we have a real opportunity to get it right. And what I don't want to see is, and this is what I'm worried about, is in other places in the GPA, where each developer did their own parcel. And, uh, you know, then you get a school in one parcel on the one side of a busy road like Mountain. And the kids can't even get to school across busy Mountain Road, for example, without being driven. So what I, my question is, uh, has there been any coordination between the developers? And is there any contemplation about uh, pedestrian connectivity between these communities or cycling infrastructure? Um, okay. Um, I just forgot. So is it Chair Jeffrey at this point? <laughs> I've answered the worst. Then <laughs> okay. uh, through the chair um, to, um, I guess, Councillor Hamlin. Um, in this case, uh, these, these, uh, these subdivisions were largely, well, first off, the Panorama or Mirror Mills Village subdivision predated Lynx View. And um, 
there's of course the the uh, golf course intervening. Um, so any pedestrian connectivity at this point would between those developments would be through any improvements that are contemplated for the 10th line. And I understand that there'll be sidewalks on both sides of the 10th line. And I believe maybe engineering can confirm this, that uh, there's also bicycle lanes contemplated on the 10th line when it's upgraded. Okay. Uh, yes, that is correct. And uh, to further build on that, the um, I also understand and then maybe um, Manager Velik can comment on this too, that the design of the roundabout proposed for the 10th line and the mountain road intersection, it has been designed to incorporate pedestrian movements as well as um, bicycle movements. Manager Velik. Yes, uh, through the chair, uh, mountain road, uh, the environmental assessment for mountain road included 10th line. Um, they both have, um, um, active transportation components built in. Mountain Road has bike lanes, sidewalks, and a multi-use trail. Tenth Line has sidewalks on both sides and um, and bike lanes as well. The the uh, proposed design was circulated to the I guess at the time the Trails Committee and has an uh, endorsement from them. Um, so and the, the the roundabout at uh, Tenth Line and Mountain Road will have uh, pedestrian crossings, you know, pavement markings. Um, the Cycling, um, I guess the setup of the cycling through the through the roundabout uh, will allow people to either cycle through the roundabout like a like a vehicle. But there are also ramps which people can enter onto uh, a wide multi-use trail and and um, go through the roundabout using the multi-use trail if they're not comfortable cycling through the roundabout. So uh, these a lot of these these subdivisions aren't. Um, you know, directly connected um, through the road road network design process, we tried to uh, provide as much as many active transportation connections as we could. Thank you, Manager Velik. Okay, so uh, Councillor Hamlin, Chair Hamlin, does that yeah. answer that question? Uh, I was just wondering uh, if I could just ask uh, as a follow up on that particular point to our senior planner Brian. The um, pedestrian connections through the golf course, of course, uh, right now there's no opportunity, but we have seen in many communities that golf courses tend to be an interim use eventually, and that the value of them as development properties far exceed their uh, usefulness as golf courses, uh, or sometimes the membership feels that way. Um, is it possible to have pedestrian connections sort of dead-ended like we do with uh, roads in many communities in case the abutting lands uh, eventually develop to allow for that? Um, to respond to that, um, the, the Mirror Mills Village Plan um, does allow for um, either through the, the integrated park and stormwater management block towards the 10th line there are potential opportunities that were the golf course to develop as a subdivision or some other use in the future, that there could be some pedestrian connectivity through that. There's also a road stub that's provided um, along that southern boundary of uh, the development, which protects for a possible future vehicular and pedestrian connection. And with the Lynx View um, subdivision, which I don't have the copy of right in in front of me, but I know that it contains it. Um, I'm going to say it contains at least three distinct opportunities for connectivity along its northern boundary via um, um, potential uh, road stubs, uh, potentially through the stormwater management pond um, block. And there's also the opportunity. Um, well, there's probably an opportunity for some kind of pedestrian active transportation route through um, an open space block in the north west corner of the plant, which I think uh, we'd always hoped would, would be part of a major north-south um, pedestrian connection from Mountain Road right down to 6th Street. But that's pretty big picture stuff, but uh, we certainly you know, keep, keep our eyes uh, open for those opportunities as well. And, and through you, Madam Chair, will that be... Um... 
provided for in these draft plans, that major uh, pedestrian connection? Um, the, um, through the chair to Councillor Hamlin, um, I believe that um, at this point, it's simply that it's recognized that the plan doesn't preclude or hinder that kind of opportunity, but there's no there's no broader upper level consideration of how that would work. Um, I'm not even sure at this point, and it's been a while since I considered this. Um, I don't even think that there's a, it's identified as a trail on our our trail schedule, but it's quite dated. But um, that was more one that um, um, previous director Nancy um, Ferrer had identified as being something that would be highly desirable and that uh, the way that the links view plan was configured uh, there's a I believe there's a walkway block that would connect this open space block to that major street um, east west street and then there's a, a north south street so it's it certainly supports that kind of connectivity and uh, of course we look for that kind of connectivity because that's obviously a, a um, a structuring element to our community is, is our active transportation system. Mm -hmm. No, I know my questions are really come up because some of the plans, you know, haven't been reviewed in a while. I mean, you've reviewed them and updated the conditions, but the uh, design of them uh, maybe uh, aren't taking into account all the things that, you know, we might think of as important today. Um, on the what, what I'll say is collector roads that connect all the uh, smaller sub streets in, the, in these developments. Is there sufficient room to allow for a dedicated bike lane in there that you know now that we're thinking about that on Finley, for example, it would be great if we could be contemplating well at least I'm thinking about it on Finley <laughs> time to share. <laughs> But uh, is it something we can think about in these communities? Has staff had a chance to, you know, think about those kind of things for these developments? Um, again, through the chair to Councillor Hamlin, um, in terms of the, the Panorama Mirror Mills Village um, subdivision, all of the roads in there would be local roads. Um, in the case of Linksview, the east, major east-west road um, while, not, um, while not shown in the official plan as a future collector road, it has been provided with a 26 meter right of way width to basically function as a collector road. Um, and um, from the original traffic impact study, I believe the recommendation was that um, that road be designed to include on-street bike lanes. Sorry, where was that recommended? Uh, it was recommended in, I believe, their traffic impact study that accompanied the original subdivision approval. It, uh, the line spoke to a combination of bike lanes or bike lanes in combination with, I believe, on-street parking. And that's what it indicated at the time. Um, subsequent conversations with manager Velik have indicated that the 26 meter right-of-way width is sufficient to allow for um, a sidewalk on one side of the street and potentially a multi-use trail on the other side. So there's even room in there to, um, to not, not have bike lanes on the road per se, but to, to hive them off. So there's flexibility with that kind of uh, width. Mm -hmm. And again, sorry to put you on the spot with these questions, but you're so knowledgeable. <laughs> um, has our, and I don't know if you know our cycling plan inside out, but I, I've looked at it again recently and I, I thought it was recommending in new developments like separate bike lanes from multi-use trails, like try and get the pedestrian separate from the cyclists at least. Um, so is a multi-use you know, sidewalk in a new subdivision the best way to approach this in your view? Yeah, um, through the chair to Councillor Hamlin, I don't have any um, any background knowledge, really extensive background knowledge on the cycling plan or, or what would be the, the pros and cons of different, different ways of dealing with active transportation um, for things like the collector roads or where, um, where the thinking may be heading in terms of um, 
of other active transportation elements and subdivisions. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, my other question, I'm getting near the end here, is um, have, has there been any consideration to a mid-block crossing of Mountain Road that would connect, for example, Red Maple and um, I don't know what it's across from, Lynx View? Like, will there be lights there or any kind of crossing for pedestrians? Because I'm assuming these, this is going to be a huge community here on both sides of 10th up to Mountain, you know, from six up. <laughs> and so there will be kids, if I can put it that way, traveling back and forth across these busy roads and perhaps even adults. And, you know, it's going to be a, a real community out there. And um, I just, so anyway, I'm just wondering how are people going to cross? You know, and I guess my, I have the same question for Mountain Road because it's quite a long distance uh, between lights, even if there is a roundabout uh, at Corner. Has, anyway, that's my question. The staff had a chance to look at this. Um, through the chair to Councillor Hanlon, I'm not, I'm not aware of any um, specific mid-block um, crossings um, along uh, Mountain Road or 10th Line. Mm -hmm. I, I would defer to engineering services in terms of the uh, of um, planned improvements to those roads. Okay, manager Billick. Oh. Yeah, so through the chair, um, Mountain Road has a, um, a mid-block uh, inter um, pedestrian signal at the at uh, Black Ash Creek, um, and Tenth uh, Line does not have currently have um, have a mid-block crossing proposed. That's something we would look at in the future once um, you know people start moving into these neighborhoods. The I know the Links View uh, intersection. I think some 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 time in the planning horizon would warrant a, a traffic signal once Links View is fully built out, um, and that's in combination with the traffic generated from the Georgian Meadows uh, subdivision. So I mean, right now, you know if. I don't know where it would go. Um, it could potentially go at the Taylor's Creek Trail uh, trailhead at 10th line. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure how that would match in in the interim. I wouldn't want to build it, um, you know, before Mara Mills is constructed. That there's not really any tie-in points. So um, I think um, I think putting in something like that is 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 potentially a bit premature. Uh, we would have to look at it. You know, once things are once things are more built out, and where we can determine the best location for that. So my concern at this point is whether um, there's a financial requirement, I guess, from these developers to contribute to the cost. Through you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, there's currently not a financial requirement for them to install that. No. Okay. Thank you. So my comment is, based on all this, is what I would like to do is uh, make a recommendation that we extend these three for one year and um, that we give these uh, developers an opportunity to get together uh, with our staff to think about how to take into account our needs um, for continuous cycling trails, for continuous pedestrian uh, points. Let's, let's have a look at the north-south um, pedestrian link that uh, senior planner Brian mentioned uh, was a possibility. Let's think about how our pedestrians are going to cross these major roads and our cyclists and make sure the developers are contributing to the cost uh, of their fair share of those things. Um, because we've come a long way in our community and how we're thinking about these things. And now's the time for us to take a hard look to make sure we end up with what I'll say is a complete community and that all the public realm issues are brought together uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, so uh, that will be what I'll be asking for. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh... Chair Hamlin, and I'll just ask for staff's response to protecting the uh, municipality uh, versus uh, if the, the time frame of the extension uh, will impact that at all. Uh, 
Um, Either one of you? Sure. Um, through, through, well, to the chair. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we hadn't we hadn't looked at a one year uh, extension. Um, that was a. Uh, uh, I'd say that hasn't been on the, the radar over the past um, um, couple of months. Um, I'm not sure that enough will have changed in a year to warrant um, revising uh, the draft plan approvals and draft plan conditions. Um, it, it may be too soon um, given um, completion of such things as the ICBL related study or even uh, completion of the official plan update. Um, so I think that, uh, I mean, I would, st I would still gravitate towards a, a longer period of extension, but not, not a four or five year extension because we, we do expect a lot of these um, uh, initiatives to be completed within the next two or three years. Okay. Um Interim Director Glenn, anything to add to, to that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, the question around, can you do it for a one-year extension? Yes, you can. It's not an automatic three-year extension. Uh, I think uh, 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 Senior Planner Brian is right uh, how much material you will change uh, with given that year, but uh, certainly uh, the community and the town have the ability to give an extension for a year within the confines of the legislation. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, Councillor Doherty, I'm gonna ask the mayor, you've already spoken, so I'm gonna go to Mayor Saunderson. Um, but before that, I'm gonna say, I asked this question on the last meeting when we had one, and I think, believe the response to me at the time was that it didn't need to be the shorter term given all the changes, there were still time within the process that the conditions could be expanded upon or changed. So I'm assuming that answer will stay the same for this one, but Mayor Saunderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. And uh, through you to staff, I'm just trying to get a sense um, under the uh, first the servicing capacity and allocation uh, conditions. And I'm just, I just want to make sure I understand uh, because I understand, you know, clearly we're trying to create a maximum amount of flexibility for the, count, the town given our uh, water restrictions. But I want to make sure if I understand if there is actually a triggering event that's going to require when the allocation is granted and when a developer can uh, depend on a building permit being issued. And if you look at uh, 1A, it says that the owner acknowledges and agrees uh, prior to final approval, all a part of the draft plan, it shall have received confirmation from the town of calling with its sufficient capacity exists in the water treatment plant and wastewater treatment plant to adequately service the development at the time of registration. And the time of registration, is that re referring to uh, uh, um, registered plan and subdivision? Um, through the chair to, um, to um, Mayor Saunderson, uh, yes. Okay. And then in the next paragraph, it, it, it backs that out to just sort of say that the owner acknowledges, or it does say, the owner acknowledges and agrees that the process requirements associated with formal allocation of servicing capacity shall be at the sole discretion of the town of Collingwood and may be provided through satisfaction of the above noted condition, which I've just read, um, through provisions to be included in the subdivision agreement and or through an alternate arrangement. And I'm just wondering what that would look like or what that might entail. Um, through the chair to um, Mayor Saunderson, the, those two conditions were, especially the second one was set up, um, the, se the second one was set up to allow for sufficient flexibility. Um, uh, the, what I, I guess I was anticipating was that the ICBL um, land use planning policy study would create some kind of greater guidance on how allocation would occur. Um, so it so built into that condition is recognition that there could be a variety of options or a variety of ways in which allocation could occur. So that if the determination is made that um, simply saying sufficient capacity exists at the time of registration, well, then 
perhaps that will be viewed as being allocation. Um, and, uh, or it could be an alternate arrangement that comes out. I mean, I'm not gonna speculate on the outcome of the ICVL study process, but the subdivision, theoretically, the subdivision could be registered because there's sufficient capacity in the system to accommodate the subdivision, whether it's a portion of the subdivision, a phase of the subdivision or the subdivision in its entirety. But formal allocation is left more flexible in that we may, we may decide that a subdivision can be registered, but if there's no formal allocation or, or allocation could be, and I think I'm gonna lose myself here, um, that would be in a situation where we were on board with registering plans of subdivision without them necessarily having formal allocation. So, I mean, it, it just protects for the for for different possibilities, um, because I know that there's been some talk that uh, that if there's a capacity allocated and it's not used, then it should be clawed back. So. I suppose I should just go back to the original, which is that the, the conditions as drafted are designed to create that flexibility for the outcome of the ICBL process. Okay, um, I follow, up. follow up please, yes. So my understanding is once there's a registered plan of subdivision, the developer can, they pay the town securities uh, and they are then able to go and put pipe in the ground and start to invest in the subdivision. So uh, if, if that allocation isn't granted when they've registered a plan of subdivision, are there going to be steps that we take as a municipality to above and beyond what's here to, to let the developer know that, uh, that by virtue, there's no allocation guaranteed once they've got their plan of registered plan of subdivision. And and if we're asking them to pay securities uh, to the town, I'm just wondering what the interplay is there uh, for them, or would we treat those later once building permits are issued? Because down under uh, section two of that paragraph three, it talks about building permits uh, uh, may uh, not be issued at any point in time in the development process. I'm just wondering how we're working with the development community to make sure that they're not investing money uh, and then not getting the permits. Um, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm interested in knowing how we are going to communicate with the development community that there's this level of uncertainty. Senior planner Brian. Um, through, through the chair to, um, to Mayor Saunderson, I think at this point, I mean, all of that kind of um, detailed direction is still pending. And the purpose of putting these conditions in at this time as worded was simply to protect for the town's ability to address the issue in the future to, to I, flag it as a to flag it as a, a definite concern and then to allow flexibility for how we ultimately address the issue in the future and I appreciate that and understand it I guess what I'm saying is I think we need to uh, as a collaborative community and we're trying to accommodate everybody's interests here make sure that we're making our development community aware of this uh, added level I guess of uncertainty especially if they're going to be investing paying securities to the town and investing money in infrastructure for a subdivision and I saw the CAO's card up on you Thank you, Chair Jeffrey, and through you to uh, Mayor Saunderson. Um, it's a good point you've raised, and um, we're more than willing to take that away. And we do have commitments through the interim control bylaw study to uh, have conversations with the development industry. So with uh, Interim Director Glenn and uh, plan Senior Planner Brian and I will uh, we'll make sure those uh, types of uh, of uh, items are discussed as we uh, we move forward to the to the new world, the post ICBL world that we're all anxious to get to. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, no further follow up, Mayor Saunderson. That's good. Uh, no, um, I look forward to hearing uh, feedback on those issues. Thanks. Okay. Before I ask um, Councillor Hamlin to put her amendment 
on the floor if she still wishes to. Uh, Councillor Doherty, you had further comments or have they been answered? Uh, I think they've been answered. Um, my, my question was going to be um, uh, based on the items that Councillor Hamlin wanted to have considered uh, among these three developers, if that could be done uh, within this, the, the three year time frame that we're already approve, uh, approving by adding the condition as opposed to uh, introducing a shorter period of time just to address the one issue. But I think I have the answer to that and it's yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm not seeing anybody put up their hand to contravene that. Okay, so um, Councillor Hamlin, do you still have, uh, you still wish to put the amendment on the floor and then I'll ask for a seconder? Um, perhaps I think Councillor Doherty, you know, is making a very good point and it, maybe it's not about time, but it's making sure that what I am suggesting uh, be addressed, be included. So really it's two things and, and uh, maybe you give me some assistance on this, but one is to uh, review each of the plans to ensure there is pedestrian connectivity and cyclist routes, both within the plans and between each plan and the surrounding community, right? And secondly, to review the street design to ensure traffic calming is built into the designs um, as much as possible. So those are the two things I would ask be, uh, be added in as conditions. All right, do I have a seconder for those to be added in? Councilor Doherty, is there any dis further discussion on the amendment? I think we've had a lot. All those in favor of the additions to Deputy Clerk, I saw your mute go off. I don't know, I'm in trouble. Go Sorry. ahead, Becky. Yeah, okay. does the amendment still include that this be reduced for a one year extension? Or are we just looking at those two no. extra conditions? Just the extra conditions? Yeah, just the extra conditions, yes. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, no problem. Okay, no other discussion on the amendment. All those in favor of those additions? Well, thank you. All right, it's unanimous. All right, and then on the original recommendation as amended, all those in favor? Oh, Councillor Doherty? We've all spoken to it. Yeah, I had wanted Bridgewater severed. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, you did ask for that. All right, so on um, Panorama and Links View as amended, all those in favor? That is carried unanimously. And then on Bridgewater uh, as amended, all those in favor, opposed, noted, and that is carried. Thank you. And now I'm pleased to pass the chair back to Chair Hamlin. <laughs> Thank you, that was an admirable job. Okay, so the next item on here uh, is 7.4. This would be the uh, temporary traffic calming report. Uh, so this item, just give me a second here. All right, I understand that uh, Director Slama and Manager Velik will be providing an overview. So I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hamlin. Yes, I'll provide an overview of the report, uh, but Manager Velik is in attendance this evening and, and able to speak to it as, as well with uh, any questions that follow. So uh, if you could put up the presentation, please. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thanks. So following uh, direction uh, from council to look at the opportunities to provide temporary traffic calming measures at uh, various locations within town, uh, the staff looked at uh, this potential and they, uh, at the locations, which included Finley Drive, 
Peel Street and all of the areas around the existing schools. And this investigation for temporary traffic calming uh, measures and, and direction was uh, outside of the traffic uh, calming policy. Um, and uh, again, looking to implement something uh, that would be temporary for now and uh, with consideration to uh, permanent infrastructure as well, placement. Next slide, please. So following the, this direction, staff reviewed the identified sites in person and contacted suppliers to see what types of temporary measures are readily available uh, to be able to be installed sooner than later and also to obtain some budget costs uh, to inform committee and council. So staff in this report have brought forward the recommendation of implementing two types of measures uh, together. So a combination of these two. So one is implementation of speed cushions and the other is uh, some flexible bollards. So the speed cushions, uh, depending on the width of the road would either be placed in groups of two or three. And then the flexible bollards would be placed as shown in this uh, photograph, which is in a set of three. So at uh, either of the edges, uh, at both edges of the road and along the center line. So these temporary measures will allow for emergency uh, vehicle access as shown, you can see that uh, most uh, fire trucks are able to straddle the speed cushions. And also the same with transit vehicles, transit vehicles are, are able to straddle the the cushions. And um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was one thing we wanted to take into uh, consideration when we looked at these measures. Uh, we have identified uh, location, uh, we have identified locations where each of these types will be installed at each of the street locations. And I'll go through those um, maps later. Uh, next slide, please, Becky. So we were able to obtain some costs and I would caution that uh, these are budgetary costs. Uh, given the short uh, time frame to put this information together at the time of gathering this uh, information for this report, we were only able to get prices from one supplier. So when we look at all of the identified sites, uh, we're looking at just under $100,000 for the implementation of these temporary measures. And I just wanted to provide an update also to committee that uh, manager Velik let me know that we did receive a second uh, price from a second supplier today, and it was $100,000 more. So uh, quite a range, I guess, in, in some of the, the prices. And in the report, uh, we have recommended that to move forward with this um, recommendation, we do follow the procurement process. So that would be, if we look at all the sites, we would be looking at uh, an open tender for procurement of the, of the units, I'll call them. And, uh, and uh, that would hopefully um, allow us to obtain the most competitive, of competitive price. So this uh, is a, a budget price. Uh, next slide, please, Becky. So before I get into the maps, there was a few things I did just want to highlight uh, that's applicable to all the locations. So uh, these are temporary measures uh, and they will need to be removed before our winter season approaches um, because they uh, cannot be in place while we do our snow clearing. So they will need to be removed uh, in October. Uh, in all likelihood before November. Uh, we considered uh, the implementation of permanent measures uh, following these um, installation of these temporary measures. And what we have recommended in our report is that we install these temporary measures and we consider permanent measures through the traffic calming policy so through requests uh, received through the policy. So uh, we have that um, consideration for committee. 
And uh, when we look at the budget, uh, where we can get the money for this work, uh, we don't have an operating budget for this type of purchase, uh, you know, around $100,000. But what we do have is a capital budget that uh, was covering the installation of traffic calming measures. So we have suggested that the remaining capital budget from that, uh, that capital, po uh, capital works pocket could be moved to the operating budget and used to uh, fund the installation of all of these uh, temporary calming measures. So I will uh, go through the site. So this is Finley Drive. And on each of these maps, uh, the blue squares indicate where we're recommending the speed cushions. And then the red uh, circles are indicating where we're recommending the set of three bollards be placed. So you can see along Finley Drive, we've, we're recommending speed cushions uh, outside of the two schools. Uh, and also one along Saunders uh, by uh, St. Mary's Catholic School, and then bollards as you're approaching the, uh, the speed bump, the speed bumps. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. So I was thinking that we were going through all the locations. So my apologies. Uh, we just showed the one and all of the locations are shown in the appendices of the report. So if there's any questions on any particular location, uh, we can answer to that. Um, another comment that uh, I wanted to mention uh, with respect to the funding or actually with respect to the timing. So the request uh, was for staff to look at opportunities to implement before September. And in contacting the suppliers and looking at the budget that we would need and the procurement process to be followed, uh, we have noted it will be difficult uh, for us to procure all of the units and install all of the units before the beginning of the school season, which is September the 3rd. So uh, an option is to still move forward with all the locations and uh, install those as quickly as possible. Uh, another option for uh, committee's consideration would be to move forward with the Finley Drive uh, measures um, only and uh, based on the uh, budget for that we would not we could do a different procurement process follow a different procurement process which would be shorter and allow us to obtain the units a little bit faster and uh, secure the installation of that location uh, definitely before September the 3rd. Uh, Another item included in the staff report uh, with respect to the funding component is that uh, Manager Valak did reach out and uh, was uh, talking about the opportunity to, or looking into the opportunity of using the Ontario Active School Travel Fund. Um, and uh, we're continuing to look and to see if the funding under that uh, program would be applicable for this and if uh, you know up to $20,000 could be used to fund these initiatives. So that uh, concludes my presentation and again Manager Velik and I are both uh, present to answer any questions. Okay well thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Clerk Dahl would there be anyone in the gallery who would like to speak to this? This. she'd like to speak to this item. Can you please raise your hand? And it appears that there's no one wishing to speak to the staff report tonight. Okay, so I'll read in the recommendation. Uh, the council received staff report PW 2021-12, temporary traffic calming, for information and support the installation of temporary traffic calming measures as identified by staff. And the council approve the transfer of up to $110,000 from the traffic calming capital budget to the public works operating budget to support the installation of temporary traffic calming infrastructure. And that council support the use of transferred operating funds within the Ontario Active School Travel Initiative Fund if confirmed eligible by staff. Um, 
Okay, so would any members of the committee have any comments or questions? I should have asked for a, um, a mover in a second. I'll get this about the 10 time my turn ends. Okay, Deputy Mayor Hall and Councillor Doherty. Okay, now would Standing Committee have any questions or comment? Deputy Mayor Hall. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, first, uh, through you to staff, a comment, and then uh, maybe a question or two of clarification. So number one is that uh, I would like to convey my sincere appreciation for the uh, report that has uh, been presented tonight, not only for uh, its thoroughness, but for the time in which it was uh, executed. It's greatly appreciated. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is you've established the bar in which we now can expect future reports to be uh, moved forward to, uh, to for, con for consideration. Uh, that said, it, it is sincerely appreciated. I guess the only maybe question that I really have is with regards to procurement. Um, I realize that the timeline is uh, tight, but given that uh, these are movable assets that would be taken away for the winter season, and if they're being installed for Labor Day, uh, I, I don't want to get into a situation where we as a, a council uh, have maybe made uh, a decision that comes along with an expectation that something will be in place for the school year. And lo and behold, we go through a procurement po uh, process in which we find that uh, we can't meet that particular date. And all, then, then the message goes from being positive and having something in place for Labor Day uh, to something that maybe doesn't in fact actually get rolled out until the winter is gone. So we're talking spring of 2022. Um, so, it, I mean, if uh, I, I was a little surprised to hear, and I'm sort of deviating from my question a little bit, but we have a number in front of us of about 95,000. And we now have a second quote. And if I heard correctly, that's 100,000 above. I mean, that's an exceptional difference. Uh, so, I don't know what the difference would be, you know, in raw materials or where they're coming from, but that's just huge. So given the fact that there's such a variance, I can appreciate why we want to go through proper due diligence, proper, um, a proper process to make sure that we're getting, you know, good value for the dollars that are being spent out of reserve. Uh, but at the same, at the same time, I would really very much like to be able to deliver on something for residents who um, are looking for us to make changes uh, as their children go back to school um, in the fall. So if I go back to my question, I guess would be one is just to clarify, uh, are, is staff confident in telling us this evening that if we focused on Finley, we would absolutely have that in place for September the 3rd and or knowing and having gone through a couple of the pure procurement uh, 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 or following with interest some of the procurement in the past and knowing how they languish. Can you give us a better sense of what you really see seeing happening between now and say the next council meeting and then what could potentially happen between the end of June and July to have this rolled out? What, what's your gut really tell you? Director Slama, would you like to answer that? Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. Actually, I'll, I'll ask uh, Manager Vellet to speak to it because he was the one who spoke with the uh, suppliers. So I think he he's more informed. Thank you. Can speak to it better, thank you. Yes, through the chair. Um, on a normal year, I would say it's doable. This is not a normal year. Every project um, seems to be have some kind of COVID delay. Um, I know purchasing really anything these days is, is challenging. Um, the suppliers right now are telling us they have stock. Um, will that change? I don't know. Um, um, I, 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 uh, I don't know if I can tell you anything with 100% certainty these days. Um, I, think it's, I think it's attainable. I think it's, um, 
I would like to try. I mean, it, but uh, I, I, I can't promise. Um, I can't promise it these days because it, it's, it's been just so difficult to purchase supplies. Um, it's been such a strange year. Director Slama. Yeah. Thank you. If I may, Chair Hamlin. Um, Manager Velik, are you able to um, speak with uh, a bit more certainty if we consider the Finley Drive units? As yeah, our timelines can be them? accelerated with if yeah. we just do that. We can we could probably shave off two weeks um, from the procurement timeline if we if we stay under that twenty five thousand dollar threshold. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vice Chair Jeffrey, did you want to add uh, clarification in here? Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, not to muddy the waters, but a conversation we're contemplating on having at Police Services Board. Um, if you'll recall, I did refer the automated and uh, AES, automated enforcement, e. ASE. <laughs> to back to police services board and um, the CAO um, did um, take the opportunity to contact um, the inspector ahead of that meeting, but we weren't able to reach it today, but um, it was the possibility of um, dealing with our uh, contract and or as an enhancement uh, for traffic uh, officers at the school zones as a, um, or a pa paid off duty officers. So I'm wondering, um, pending that recommendation, which will come out of a special meeting if they agree to, to recommend to council, but maybe we don't need that from the police services board would be in the short term, a way of um, dealing with um, enforcement at the school, uh, locations within the community safety zones um, while we contemplate our um, uh, procurement processes. You know, I find it really frustrating that other municipalities all across Canada, if it's important, somehow they're getting it done. And we just seem to be so bogged down by uh, these policies. So for me, at least um, the potential for the paid off duty officers um, is the ability to have um, them dedicated specifically to that. They don't get uh, called into their platoon for other priorities for the hours that they spend on that. Um, they are specifically enforcing at these zones and um, the tickets mean something versus the automatic um, speed enforcement uh, equipment. Um, there's, um, it's not just a monetary, once you have the off, uh, paid off duty officers there um, there's real ramifications that go with uh, with the ticketing and the stops. So, and great uh, um, appearance, education, and, and awareness. So, um, I'm going to throw that out there now. It's kind of superseding the discussion at the police services board, but maybe um, we can use that avenue pending, and I maybe look to CAO Skinner to comment on the wisdom of that. Thank you. Thank you. CEO Skinner. I didn't realize I didn't have my uh, video or my uh, sound on. Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Chair, to Vice Chair Jeffrey. Um, yes, I do think that uh, there is a possibility of uh, dealing with enforcement at school uh, in school zones and even providing a, a visual deterrent potentially uh, with the use of paid duty officers. And I think. Um, pending a little bit more conversation with the detachment commander, this might be something that's quite flexible. Um, and in, uh, in the case that we weren't able to install, for example, uh, uh, traffic calming at one or more of these locations, we could uh, backfill uh, you know, weeks potentially of service um, with that opportunity. I, um, uh, from a procurement perspective, uh, and I was just actually trying to read the bylaw quite quickly, but typically what happens uh, with the procurement delegation of authority, uh, what council has actually done with that bylaw or a typical bylaw of this type would be to delegate procurements to staff under certain, under certain conditions. 
So if you have under 25,000, for example, you can go through a certain uh, process. Um, so with your question about other municipalities getting procurements done, um, you know, where it was the will of council, I was wondering if there was more flexibility. I almost hesitate to ask the question, but in a way I, I, I do also want to ask that question so that council's uh, um, well, committee and then council's wills can be uh, um, brought forward um, as, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so just to sum up uh, with the recommendation today, I think that um, uh, you've raised some good questions and there would be a chance for some amended paragraphs in the report should you endorse it to go forward uh, where we could address the procurement process, potentially um, uh, what could be saved from a timing perspective if we didn't do a competitive uh, uh, process and uh, uh, also potentially some insights from the OPP around uh, the type of notice they would need if we were to go with a uh, paid duty enforcement in school zones in the fall um, for some, uh, some period of time. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, as worded by our very competent CAO, I'd like to add those to, um, to our recommendation to council. Okay, thank you. And Deputy Mayor Hall, I wanted to ask you if you had any follow-up to the uh, questions that you were asking. I'm sorry, I, uh... I... I don't, and I appreciate the comment uh, provided by the CAO. And I'm hoping that perhaps we could just move this forward to council and perhaps those questions could be answered in the interim and then all of council could uh, make a decision. Thank you. Would anyone else have any comments or questions at this point? Councillor Doherty. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and just uh, quickly, just so I understand um, the alternate proposals that we're tossing around right now. So uh, first of all, just to get Finley Drive prioritized and in place by September 3rd, what you're suggesting is not to tender that single one because it's under our um, limit, but to continue to tender for the rest. That's my first question. Or are we just saying we're only gonna do Finley Drive? Yeah, who would like to answer that? Director Slama. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. Uh, good question, Councillor Doherty, uh, because uh, if I misunderstood CEO, maybe I misunderstood CEO Skinner. I thought we were going to look at the opportunities for to, um, to keep the recommendation as it is for the implementation at all sites and look at the opportunities for faster procurement and if uh, that opportunity wasn't available, then we would uh, provide some information on uh, using some the uh, paid duty officer as an interim measure. Is that correct? Uh, CAO Skinner, would you like to comment? Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would add as well that Manager Velik, I think, had outlined an option, um, actually, it might have been Director Slama, had outlined an option, um, which I think Councillor Doherty was talking about, that if one location was to go forward under a, a faster procurement process, mm -hmm. that would be Finley Drive and not the others. And if they would both nod and confirm that I understood that correctly, but I think that was the intention. If one went forward with a more guaranteed time frame, uh, they were thinking Finley Drive. And then, but just to follow up uh, and restate Councillor Marie's question, which was, because I had the same one. <laughs> um, if it turned out we could only do one and it was Finley Drive to get it done quickly, will the others still proceed in, you know, as a group, uh, mm -hmm. a longer procurement process? Can we still expect they'll be dealt with? I think that was your question, Councillor Doherty. Yeah, that's correct. And that's uh, <laughs> okay, so thank you, Chair Hamlin. Okay, so we will look, we look at the opportunities to move forward with Finley Drive. Um, 
have our conversations with the procurement officer, see what our opportunities are to procure that infrastructure as quickly as possible. So we can have conversations with the procurement officer about moving forward with the um, with a, a more open tender for the rest of the works. Um, I would like to have that discussion with the procurement officer and review the procurement bylaw with her because um, when we look at uh, purchasing um, uh, similar type uh, materials or services, um, then we 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 are not to be doing we're not to be doing it piecemeal, right? So we're supposed to be doing it all together. So I would just need to to see what the opportunities are that are within the uh, within the bylaw as uh, CAO Skinner has indicated. But I think we can have that conversation with mm -hmm. the procurement officer and report back before council. Um, the right. second point, if I may, and I think I'd, I just wanted to highlight something that Deputy Mayor Hall mentioned, which is moving forward with the rest of the sites. If we're unable to secure the materials, and install, you know, in September, or even if we do, so we, we are able to, we obtain the materials and we install in September, but then we take it away in October. So I, I think he raised a good point, um, you know, and I think it's something that the committee should consider and, um, you know, how that um, is perceived um, or, uh, you know, I believe he worded it, right? Setting up false expectations, right? Installing something for only a month and then having to take it away. So our, our interest would be to try and purchase something as quickly as possible and get it installed as quick as possible. So we have a longer time frame and we have a time uh, to convey that message to the public that, um, they will need to be removed for the winter season and that expectation uh, is there from the public. So um, I, we do have some concerns with installing something in September and taking it away in October. Do you have another question, Councillor Doherty? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I would have thought that we wouldn't be removing them until the end of October. I mean, we, we're not gonna anticipate getting any significant amount of snow until beginning of November. So then we would, at least we would have two months. Um, okay, uh, and then um, is this going to take away from the budget for the Maple Street bikeway? Uh, through the chair, it will not, those are separate budgets. Okay. Great, okay, fine. And uh, finally, um, I wonder if it might be uh, worth looking into the green municipal, the green municipal fund. Uh, I know you are looking at an Ontario uh, government of Ontario grant. Uh, the green municipal fund uh, does have a um, transportation stream. So whether that I I tried to find the details on that. It's not clear whether active transportation or traffic calming would be part of that, but you don't ask, you don't get. So uh, maybe we could investigate that and Councillor Jeffrey could put a real good word in for us. And those are my questions, thank you. Okay, would any uh, other member of the committee, uh, sorry, I have to keep turning off my video to let my dog in and out. <laughs> Joys of uh, cheering from home. Um, any other member of the committee have any questions or comments on this? Okay, I have just one. Uh, if these are taken down in late October, early November, whatever, um, will they go back up in the spring? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin. Uh, so they will be installed, yeah, again, back in the spring. Um, I did check with uh, manager Cole, and it would need to be done once we've completed our spring sweeping, road sweeping program. So he said it, uh, it will likely be May, at some point in May. Okay, thank you. 
All right. So, uh, Councillor Jeffrey has asked that we sever out the uh, Cameron Road Public School um, part of this. So, uh, what I'll do is ask for a vote on uh, all of the uh, report, save for the part that would relate to the Cameron Public School. Uh, all in favor? That's carried unanimously. And uh, Councillor Vice Chair Jeffrey, you'll leave the room, and therefore we can now vote on the recommendations as relates only to the camera. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I would be asking. Yes, uh, amendment. <laughs> Oh, it's time for a break. Okay, but we're almost done. So I'm going to pursue because I know the hockey game's coming. All right. Uh, so we're on to item number eight on the agenda. And that would be the uh, report of the uh, Collingwood Heritage Committee. So I'll read in the recommendation here that the minutes of the Collingwood Heritage Committee meeting held May 17, 2021 be received and the recommendations contained therein be approved. Uh, so could I have a mover and a seconder for that please? Deputy Mayor Hall, Vice Chair Jeffrey, thank you. Uh, would any member of the Standing Committee have any questions or comments regarding those minutes? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. For the consent agenda, uh, which is item number nine, um, I'm going to uh, read these all in together. Uh, the recommendation here is the council herein receive the general consent agenda and motions identified below uh, be approved and further that the information and opinions providing the general consent agenda items are, are that of the authors and are not verified approved or approved as being correct. So 9.1 recommendation that the following request for redesignation through the official plan update be received and referred back to the director of planning for appropriate action as outlined in staff report P2020-02 through the official plan update process. And there are four here. Cranberry Golf Course, uh, and that is 22 Harbor Street. Uh, the second one is Parataxis Design and Development Corporation. That relates to 452 Raglan, 7340 Poplar Side Road, uh, 490 Raglan Street, and then a roll number, which I'll read out, 433-108-000-572-300. The third one is for 390 Mountain Road, and the fourth one is Georgian Communities, referred to as various properties south of 6th Street, west of Black Ash Creek. All right. Could I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Uh, Councillor Doherty. Oh, Deputy Clerk Dahl, I missed something. Go ahead. Uh, to chair, so there was a second consent agenda item for the NVCA on there. Right. Well. Um, right. And we also have a member of the public that wants to speak to one of the items in that motion. Uh, that would, in the motion I've just read? Correct. Yeah. All Mr. right. Leo Longo is on the line. Okay. So uh, perhaps it would be appropriate to uh, hear from Mr. Longo at this point. Yes. And then uh, request me for a second. So I'll just let him in here. Good evening, uh, Chair Hamlin, committee members. I hope you can hear me. I will be brief. You have in section uh, 9 1 of your agenda the requests for redesignation of certain um, properties. I'm speaking solely to the one by Parataxis Design and Construction Corporation. My client is Eden Oak Raglan, Inc. They are the owners of 452 Raglan Street. If you look at the Parataxis request for redesignation, a sketch is attached that has four sites that are the subject of their request. 
site three on that graphic is now owned by my client, Eden Oak Raglan Inc. And I have submitted a letter to um, the clerk requesting that if you are receiving and referring these requests to counts to staff, would you also formally receive my June 14 letter in which I indicate that our client, the new owner of 452 Raglan, uh, is not part of that request, does not want to be part of that request, and that request should be um, uh, treated uh, in that fashion with that information. Just for background for our client, for the council committee, our client purchased in February of this year, and I believe they have already had their initial uh, pre-consultation meeting with staff to deal with the development proposal that they would like to be pursuing on their recently acquired lands. So thank you for your attention. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have, but please just simply, for the record, receive my letter um, of uh, June 14, so that you know that the parataxis request is now qualified by at least one of the owners uh, that was in that re request originally. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Longo, and uh, your letter's been received and uh, your comments noted. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, would any of the members of the committee have any questions of Mr. Longo? Okay, there are none. So thank you, Mr. Longo. Have a good evening, Council. Thank you. All right. So at this point, are there any other comments uh, with respect to these uh, consent items, Deputy Clerk Dahl, from the public? I mean, I think at this time. Um, I don't know, based on Mr. Longo's comments, if we want to amend that motion to remove 452 Raglan Street. Well, I think it would be a good idea. Okay, so um, So do we have to formally have a mover and a Could someone move uh, that? That would be Vice Chair Jeffrey and a seconder for that amendment, uh, Mayor Saunderson. Okay, thank you. Um, and I should add in, uh, before we um, deal with this further, the 9.2, which is the NBCA board meeting highlights from May 28, 2021. Uh, were there any comments uh, or questions about that? Okay, seeing none. So what I'll do is ask for uh, a vote on the amendment to re... Uh, so we have to move again and second that. Yes, Council Deputy Clerk Dahl, yes. Um, so I don't think we have a mover and seconder for the main motion yet. I think we did. I, I so think that's Jeffrey, Councilor and Jeffrey and Mayor Saunderson for the main motion? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, could I have someone make a move the amendment and second it? Councilor Doherty and Deputy Mayor Hall. So we'll vote on the amendment, all in favor? That's carried and uh, we'll vote on the motion then, all in favor? And that's carried, thank you. In terms of departmental updates, I have two listed here. Uh, the first one- Sorry, is uh, Chair Hamlin. Yes. Could I, I, I still wanted to request a, an item to be pulled for a question. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Um, it was uh, 9.1, specifically the uh, redesignation of the Cranberry Golf Course. Um, the question actually is from a macro perspective, so it actually would apply to the process in general. But if I could, through you to um, our interim director, uh, Mr. Glenn, if, if he could provide for the public comment on 
what it means for somebody to request a redesignation. And more importantly, because we do have some residents who have voiced concerns specifically to this golf course and the, re, uh, the potential of a redesignation. And I think it would just be from a macro perspective, important tonight to be able to convey to the public, what does this specifically mean in the context of today through to the end of our official um, plan uh, process that we are engaged in uh, at this point? Thank you. Interim Director Glenn, can you respond to that? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, in a macro sense, uh, these four um, applicants or proponents have made a request to, to the municipality to redesignate the use of their land as it exists in the official plan today. And they want that accomplished through your um, comprehensive official plan review that you're doing. Um, Typically, municipalities um, will entertain some requests, but they don't entertain specifically official plan amendments. And that's what these basically are to redesignate the purpose of their land. So they're being referred to staff. They'll be included in as part of the review of the official plan. Uh, and that the, they won't be amendments specifically brought forward for the lands. They'll be included as part of the official plan. Either they will be included or they'll not be included and then the proponents will have the opportunity to support or not support the official plan as it goes forward. But in the macro scale, uh, they're being referred for the consideration in your official plan update uh, that will be brought back uh, late 2021, early 2022. Any follow-up Deputy Mayor Hall? Uh, no, that was perfect. Thank you very much. And so maybe I'll just uh, ask a question if I could, uh, uh, following up from that to our interim director, Glenn. So if members of the public wish to have a comment on any of these uh, suggested amendments, when will their time come? Um, there will be a full uh, public exercise as part of the official plan review that will include any land use changes or designations for properties. And that's the time in which they would get involved with regards to whether it's public open houses, formal public meetings, um, or even public deputations as they relate to each phase of the official plan as it goes forward. So it's kind of watch uh, your area, watch what's going on in the official plan and participate in the public process. Good, thank you so much. All right, on to number 10, departmental updates. Uh, can we hear from you, Interim Director Glenn, on number one, Heritage Building Materials? Yeah, there, there was a question that came from uh, the Heritage Committee through the BIA around the appropriate use of uh, heritage building materials. And it was referred back to staff and uh, <clears throat> Justin, which is with us, deals with our heritage matters. Uh, and his, there is some new, um, I'm not sure if it's a regulation coming in July 1st, and we plan to bring a report back to committee and council on the building materials and the heritage district uh, at that time. Okay, that's great. Uh, community planner Tickle, would you like to add to that? Yeah, just that, um, so to, in order to report back to council um, and to consult with Heritage Committee necessitated bringing that report back in July. Um, and yeah, there are some changes coming to the Ontario Heritage Act as well. So um, I'd like to review those as well before uh, bringing a report forward. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, would any member of the committee have questions uh, with respect to that update? Okay, seeing none, thank you for that. Uh, the second update is by Director Slama, and I think maybe our CEO Skinner is gonna do this, I'm not sure, I'll let you guys fight over it on the membrane, a membrane replacement update. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll provide the update on the, uh, the membrane upgrade. So I just wanted to provide uh, some information uh, for committee. Uh, just to provide information on some work that we've been doing to upgrade our membranes and also some membrane repair. So in accordance with our capital asset management plan and the council approved capital budget, we have replaced one full train of our membranes at the water treatment plant. So we have five trains of uh, 500 style of Z-weed uh, membranes and we've replaced one of those full trains uh, these 
the new membranes, new membranes are replacing membranes that were installed in the last that were installed in 1998 and also some that were installed in 2005. So these membranes have a life expectancy of 10 years. So uh, they were working well past their uh, life expectancy and we're pleased to have um, a new train up and running. And the, this style also uh, has been upgrade, uh, upgraded over the years. And with, uh, when we replace a train with the uh, new, new model, I guess, uh, then we receive some redundancy in capacity. So that's also uh, good news uh, for us that uh, we, we have a little bit of redundancy built in. We're uh, staff are continuing to do some work on uh, they can repair some of the the most aged membranes that we still have. So we we do have now one train. Our oldest train has some membranes that are uh, were installed in two thousand and five and two thousand and twelve. So staff are performing some repairs on those membranes to uh, so that we can have the best uh, production efficiency as possible. And this new train of membranes, it is the intention that this new train will be used in the uh, water treatment plant expansion. Um, so we're, we're hoping that they can be transferred over to that design. And I also wanted to let the committee be aware that uh, staff are looking now at, uh, we have one train of one, a model 1000s. And uh, so it's got four modules within it and uh, we're doing some repair work on those. It's a different style. It's uh, at more production from that style of membranes. Uh, those membranes are eight, are, were installed in 2012 and some in 2017. So it's looking like we're probably gonna see a budget request to replace uh, one of the 2012 units uh, going into budget in 2022. And I just wanted to mention that uh, in discussions with manager McGinnity, she noted that just to uh, maintain our rated capacity as we um, continue to work towards our expansion, uh, council may, might see further budget requests to replace some of the, uh, the most aged membranes. So, so right now, good news that we've got a, a new train um, that's uh, helping sec secure our available capacity uh, we're, and the uh, operators are pleased to see that. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Chair Hamlin, through to uh, Director Salama. So what percentage of the plant um, I, is in the original unreplaced uh, membranes. So uh, through the chair. So your question is which? How much have we updated, I guess, maybe on the flip. Okay. Side. So so all the membranes were installed in 1998 and there was some replacement in 2005, some in 2012. So we've just, we've gotten rid of all the 1998s now. Uh, there is a bit of 2005 and some 2012 still remaining. And then there was repa uh, replacements, I believe. Uh, we have membranes uh, age dated 2014, 17, eight, and 18, and then 2021. Thank you, and a follow-up, Chair Hamlin. Just um, so the, I think if my memory serves me correctly, the cost of one of those trains is around a million. But, yeah, but through the, yeah, through the chair, I believe that this train cost in the range of 1.3 million. Okay. Oh, poor full train. Thank you. Okay, would there be any other questions of a committee member? Okay, seeing none, thank you for that. Director um, Are there any additional items staff would like to bring up to the standing committee at this time? Okay, seeing none. Next item on the agenda is public delegations. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to the standing committee on any matter that hasn't Sorry. been discussed? Sorry. Yeah. Through the chair to uh, the attendees. We have two, we have one phone in participant and we also have a, uh, another participant, uh, Dana 
I'm going to say your last name wrong. Kaleen, Kaleesi? So allow her to speak first, and then I'll put the phone participant in. Hello. OK, thank you. Hello. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, it's Dana Kaluzny. You did a pretty good job. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair, and hello and good evening to all the um, counselors here tonight. Um, just an update uh, regarding Enswell Beer. We're still here <laughs> and we're still dedicated to, uh, to our community small batch brewery um, ending well, which means being a community cub in Collingwood and sharing a beer, um, many beers with all of you and uh, the rest of our community. Um, we've had some challenges since uh, our deputation in October um, not to mention uh, the ICBL, which happened just at the time when we um, were able to find a site that was in the M2 zoning, the only zoning available um, for a brewery currently in Collingwood. Um, so this has been a, about a two year journey for us. So um, we just wanted to bring it to your attention that we will be putting forth um, an exemption application before Friday. Um, we're really excited about moving forward with this site, um, which is a space we'll be leasing um, at 395 Raglan. We hope to create what could be a Collingwood's distillery district with um, the distilleries and also the uh, what will hopefully be two breweries in that area. And um, we also wanted to let you know that part of our application will include a really unique wastewater diversion system by Biogill, um, which diverts um, the water that breweries use and a lot of the effluent that could go back into the system and actually diverts it back into the brewery system, converting it to gray water to be used on site. Um, I was previously the co-chair of the environmental committee at Steam Whistle Brewing and both Mike and I as co-owners are really passionate about environmental justice and we will continue to put forth those efforts in addition to um, the ad addressing the wastewater and water capacity here in the town of Collingwood. Thanks so much for your time and yeah we look forward to uh, moving forward and in well. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you for that update. Uh, and the second uh, person, uh, Deputy Clerk uh, Dahl, who yeah. was that? Yeah, so it's a phone call. So if you could please state your name um, to the committee so we know who we're speaking to. Hello, am I coming through okay? Yes, you are. Okay, it's Tim Fryer, 75 Georgia Manor Drive. And I wanna thank uh, Chair Hamlin for the opportunity to present to you and the committee members. Um, I have a couple of matters that I would like to briefly cover with you at this time. The first pertains to Staff Report T-2021-09, Water and Sewer Arrears, presented last week to the SIC. Regarding my referring to it here, last week I had a number of concerns about the report's contents, but wanted to first hear Council's input. So I didn't address it when the agenda item was on the table. But then my planned use of the five minutes allowed before the meeting ends didn't work out. I had raised my hand, but it appears that there was some sort of glitch because it wasn't recognized. So this is the next opportunity. A major matter that I was going to address back then isn't relative to this committee, but there is one that is. I was going to ask the SIC why this report was even on their agenda. I was inclined then to wonder if it was because environmental services matters are now appropriately going to be part of the SIC purview. That was answered though with this agenda's update on membrane replacement item. I note then that I continue to submit that environmental services should be part of the Committee of the Whole SIC purview to hopefully help reduce these types of issues. When I first considered the report's contents, the most significant concern I had was about the town possibly deactivating a municipal customer's water supply. In my experience, I don't believe this can be done, and that is why neither the former commission or board ever considered it. That concern, though, was de-elevated by council's comments, some of which appeared to indicate it would only be in extraordinary situations that this would even be considered. 
but the report and discussions didn't alleviate another concern I have had for some time. What is happening with utility services since EPCOR has taken over? This stems from the overall concern I presented to Council in the past. Why did EPCOR want call us ownership so badly that they were willing to pay the premium they did? It doesn't appear to have anything to do with providing better service delivery, in my opinion. This is another example of that, as I have checked with other LDCs and haven't found that this type of situation has developed with their collection of services for municipal water. I will hopefully be reviewing this subject in more depth at the summit that Miri is holding this week to see if I can find out anything further about it. What this situation is costing, as you would expect, is another concern. The issues relative to the impacts of the costs link back to my point I raised with Council that there continues to be a significant subsidization from taxpayers to water ratepayers due to the current cost allocation methodology. Hopefully there isn't subsidization in turn of EPCOR customers by water ratepayers occurring as a result. Time doesn't allow for a detailed presentation to the committee on this. That will need to be done at a later date. The committee is aware of the concerns I've raised about a lack of public access to the liaison committee and that council decision contributes to my view that the impact of EPCOR operations needs to be scrutinized. The current situation means that it can't be done until when EPCOR provides the OEB and public with their detailed operations information in the upcoming cost of service rate application. Interveners will be allowed to carefully examine its contents at that time. I will summarize on this for now with those observations, but also close off with a reinforcement of my contention that the EPCOR meetings should be open to the public so that input can be provided in a timely manner. The second matter I would like to be very briefly address isn't the same general observation type though, but rather a specific question for the DNO committee. As you know, I've asked some historical for some historical detail in regards to the chlorine dosing formula adjustment, apparently proactively made by staff with assistance by the ministry sometime back in 2018. I was unable to listen to the earlier update on this agenda for water capacity issue, so it may have been covered there. Or if not, it may have been covered in one of the other previous updates and during my review of those, I missed it. If not, though, I was hoping to get an indication from the committee as to when there will be a response and if it would be done in an update session. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Fryer. I think uh, that portion of the meeting that uh, you weren't able to listen to this evening, we did receive an update. Uh, and that staff has uh, gone out to tender for uh, a consultant who will be uh, providing some advice on chlorine dosing. So that will be still to come. So thank you for your uh, comments though this evening. All right, is that, are those all of the uh, members of the public uh, who wish to speak, Deputy Clerk Dahl? Hamlin, I'll just call one last time. So if there's anyone wishing to speak to the committee this evening, if you could please raise your hand. And it doesn't appear there's anyone else. Okay, thank you. Uh, the last uh, item, well, next to last item would be other business. Would any member of the committee have any other business they wish to raise? Seeing none, we're on to the last item, which could be the adjournment. Vice Chair Jeffrey, thank you. All in favor? And that might be unanimous. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, have, a, have a good evening and uh, good luck, uh, Deputy Mayor Hall on your favorite team duty.